by the House Government Operations Subcommittee on Employment and Housing. The topic is the investigation by the Inspector General of the Department of Housing and Urban Development that revealed abuse of HUD's Section 8 Moderate Rehabilitation Program. You'll hear from HUD Secretary Jack Kemp. Subcommittee on Employment and Housing will please come to order. As we resume our series of hearings on the abuse and mismanagement in housing programs administered by the Department of Housing and Urban Development, our sole witness this afternoon will be our new Secretary of HUD, Jack Kemp. Since he became the quarterback at HUD earlier this year, Secretary Kemp has been blitzed by scandals of his predecessor. Program after program has been found riddled with abuse, favoritism, and mismanagement. The Section 8 Moderate Rehabilitation Program designed to benefit the poor became a federal assistance program for former HUD officials and the politically well-connected. The property disposition program was administered with such a lax procedure that private escrow agents were able to siphon off millions of dollars from property sales simply by not remitting the proceeds to HUD. Astronomically high default rates and abuses have been found in the coinsurance program, the Title X Land Development Mortgage Insurance Program, and the Retirement Service Center Program. Equity skimming has become a major criminal sport in many areas of the country. Never one who liked to punt, in each instance, Secretary Kemp has responded promptly, forcefully, and decisively. He has canceled funding decisions, frozen programs, suspended certain companies and individuals from participating in HUD programs, and redrafted rules to foster competition. In short, Secretary Kemp has brought new leadership and a commitment to change HUD. During much of the 1980s, while HUD was engulfed by the modern-day plagues of influence peddling, favoritism, mismanagement, abuse, greed, fraud, embezzlement, and theft, former HUD Secretary Pierce was apparently oblivious to it all. I personally welcome the hands-on, responsible, energetic, and decent leadership of Secretary Kemp. It is indeed a pleasure to welcome our former colleague and my good friend, Secretary Jack Kemp, who is making what I hope will be the first of many appearances before this subcommittee. The subcommittee intends to work very closely with Secretary Kemp to clean up the swamp at HUD and to provide affordable and decent housing for all Americans. Before I turn it over to the ranking Republican, may I just say, that I would be hard put to find an individual with your qualifications of passionate commitment to a functioning free society, honesty and integrity in government, who would be better qualified at this stage in the troubled life of HUD to take over the reins. Congressman Lukens. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to associate myself um, with a great degree of warmth and enthusiasm with the Chairman's opening remarks and welcome you also as a uh, colleague and a friend of long standing. We've seen these hearings on HUD programs progress under the dynamic and aggressive uh, leadership of our chairman and members of this committee. And during that course, we've seen fundamental problems revealed in both the programs themselves and in their operation. In some programs, funds are going to developers who provide the intended service to low and moderate income people we're trying to help. However, the cost of giving incentives to developers to provide assistance far exceeds the cost thus far of directly providing assistance to people we want to help themselves. This point is exemplified by the problems we've experienced, especially with moderate housing rehabilitation, or MHR programs. 
Fortunately, HUD's been rife with these programs, or these problems from the start. From its inception, we've encountered great difficulty with management, corruption, and fraud. Looking now at the last eight years, we can also dwell even a time preceding the last eight years. Glancing at a series of articles from the Boston Herald, for example, in Massachusetts in 1980, specifically June 22nd of that year, it states that 70% of the money raised by the Carter campaign in Massachusetts as of April 15th that year came from Section 8 developers, even way back then. The Herald goes on to report on January 23rd. At the same time, all records show that campaign, Section 8 developers in the state who contributed to that campaign, all of them were successful subsequently in winning approval for these new projects, especially the MHR. Supporters also gained access to Assistant HUD Secretary that date, federal housing commissioners, and people who flew, uh, controlled the flow of that Section 8 money. Clearly, it's been a continuous problem over two decades with the MHR program specifically, but with all housing programs. I would like to briefly, however, commend Paul Adams, the Inspector General, for bringing to light many of these problems, although I do wish we had more aggressive prosecution and follow-up on the problems once they were brought to light. And I join my chairman and I think every American in welcoming Secretary Kemp not only to the committee, but to new stewardship. We need to eliminate faulty program design, and to wipe out totally bad management, if at all possible. In these lofty goals, we wish Secretary Kemp well. And of course, we hope and pray that these improvements can be accomplished as quickly as possible. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Congressman Martinez. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I don't have a statement, although I'd like to leave the record open, and I might prepare a statement for the record. Without Let me just say uh, welcome to Secretary Kemp. And over the five years that he served in Congress while I was here, he served longer than that, but I mean, I knew him for five years and saw him on the House floor and I always had a great deal of confidence in his objectives then and I know that his objectives now are much the same. And on the third page of his uh, prepared statement, I think that he said, makes a statement that none of us could uh, really, that all of us could agree with. And it said that what he could not anticipate three months ago was to the extent of uh, the legacy they inherited of abuse and mismanagement. I don't think any of us before uh, these hearings started could have imagined that it was as bad as it was. I know that on the several occasions that I had the opportunity to interact with the agency over there, it was always very difficult for me to act in, in behalf of the communities that I represent. It almost seemed in the one time that I did meet and talk to Samuel Pierce that uh, he wasn't really cognizant of, of much of what he had to be cognizant of to be able to help us serve our constituencies. And it, it irritates me to some degree uh, that it was so difficult for many of us in Congress uh, to open the doors for our constituents to the opportunities that should have existed there for them. And uh, I have uh, full confidence now that the situation will be uh, remedied. I know that it's going to be tough. I know that we're going to have to work very closely. And we can't uh, bother about uh, pointing our fingers at each other and blaming uh, things for things not progressing faster than they should. It's going to be a slow, tedious product. Uh, uh, project and I think that uh, we, what we need to do is come together in full harmony and cooperation to rectify this and to help the Secretary uh, get this agency out of the mess that it's in. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Congressman Kyle. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would make an opening statement, but I think all of us don't want to uh, pass up the opportunity to welcome our former colleague, Secretary Kemp. Uh, it is a real pleasure to have him here and Mr. Chairman, uh, I would associate myself also with your remarks, particularly the last uh, paragraph or so in which you indicated that you couldn't think of anyone at this time more qualified to lead this department and to address the problems that have befallen the department. Uh, Secretary Kemp is an idea man, and clearly uh, the answers to the problems that uh, relate to the housing in this country <coughs> require a lot of new ideas. And I can't think of anyone who is more capable of providing those ideas and the kind of leadership that will be required than Secretary Kemp. It's a pleasure to have you here and welcome. Thank you very much. Congressman Wise. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, too, just want to say hello to Secretary Kemp. Uh, uh, I don't think you signed on for this job, but I always wanted to meet the fellow who's a, whose job it is to clean the Algerian stables. Um, Hercules had a tough, tough assignment, and I think you've got one, too, but you've been bringing a lot of energy. I also want to uh, recognize um, your assistant, Mr. Delabovi, whom I'm quite frankly sorry that you 
snatched away from UMTA because I had an application for methanol buses that was just about to go, I think. Uh, and, and incidentally, he did it by the book, we'll which I appreciate, uh, too. But uh, it, is, it is good to have you here and look forward to this Thank hearing. You. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Congressman Shays. Secretary Kemp, I just want to welcome you here and just tell you that I am extraordinarily grateful that you are in the position you're in. And also to welcome your undersecretary. I think that you both are going to make an exceptional team. You have a major job, and you know what that job is, and you have the full support of this committee. And I just welcome you here today, and I'm, again, grateful that both of you are willing to undertake this task. Thank you. It's been the practice of this subcommittee to invite uh, colleagues from other committees particularly the Housing Committee, and we are pleased again to welcome Congressman Schumer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and once again, let me thank you for your gracious invitation, and more important than that, your outstanding leadership. You've been a great credit to the Congress, uh, as has this committee throughout this, these past harrowing two months. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, earlier in, in this HUD crisis, I said that the fox was guarding the hen house in Ronald Reagan's HUD. Secretary Kemp, it's good to finally have someone keeping the foxes away from HUD again. And I'm delighted you're here. Uh, we were colleagues in Congress, and I was colleagues in the New York State Assembly with your able uh, associate, Mr. Della Bovee. The two of you haven't had an easy job these last few months. Many have feared that HUD has been like a punch-drunk fighter on the verge of a knockout blow from just one more scandal. Mr. Secretary, you deserve a great deal of credit for keeping HUD on its feet during this time. I think the American public believes that cleaning up HUD is not a Democratic issue or a Republican issue. Cleaning up HUD is a bipartisan issue. Clearly, the only way we'll succeed is if we all work together, Congress and the administration, Democrats and Republicans, to get HUD back on course. Mr. Secretary, I also commend you for your commitment to draining the HUD swamp, for being willing to act swiftly and cancel programs that are beyond rehabilitation. At the same time, I encourage you to proceed very carefully in suspending housing programs for the nation's poor. We must turn off faucets at, at the HUD tap if the hose is leaking, but we must also remember that the desert of this country's housing crisis desperately needs water. Mm -hmm. Secret Mr. Secretary, <coughs> let me say in closing, I know that several months back you were under consideration for the position of NFL commissioner. While I'm sure you would have made a great football commissioner, I'm pleased you've decided to stay in Washington. Right now, we need you with your energy and enthusiasm quarterbacking HUD. Thank you, Thank Thank you. you Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Congresswoman Rukema. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I want to thank you again for your courtesies in inviting members of the Housing Subcommittee to attend these hearings. And I also want to commend you again publicly for uh, your outstanding leadership. Uh, your rhetoric has received notable acclaim and recognition in the national press. And it has not only been colorful, Mr. Chairman, but it has uh, uh, correctly and accurately portrayed precisely what we're talking about here. Uh, Mr. Secretary, uh, former colleague, as the ranking Republican on the Housing Subcommittee, I want to welcome you here today. And thank you in advance for all the fine work that you have done. Jack, I remember it wasn't too many weeks ago or months ago that you appeared before our, our committee and you were greeted warmly on a bipartisan basis. You uh, gave an outstanding uh, representation of yourself and your intentions and goals for the department at that time. Uh, we welcomed you as a uh, a breath of fresh air, and one who was going to be more than a breath of fresh air, but was going to be strong and vigorous in refocusing and directing the spotlight on housing issues across the board. Since then, unfortunately, you've uh, hit a detour, but I consider it only a detour. I want you to know that many reporters have called me over the past few weeks and asked, can HUD be put back together again. I think what they really were saying was, can Humpty Dumpty put be, be put back together again? And I have said on each occasion that, uh, yeah, I believe it can be, and I believe that Jack Kemp is the man to do that. You are going to um, have a golden opportunity here. 
And I believe it may be, Jack, a blessing in disguise for all of us. Because in putting Humpty Dumpty back together again, we can begin some new initiatives. We can not only correct the problems and management problems of the past, but redirect our attention to some better ways of producing housing for this country. So I want to welcome you here. I thank you for being here and look forward with great anticipation to your forthright and intelligent approaches to the problem. Thank you. Congressman Rukum, I want to thank you very much. I will ask the Secretary to formally introduce his two associates before he begins his testimony. Thank you. Your entire prepared statement will be entered into the record in total. Uh, <coughs> if uh, if uh, you wish to proceed in other, any other way, you may do so. The Chair would like to indicate one final item before we call on our distinguished secretary. It has been the custom of the chairman to swear in witnesses during the course of this very complex investigation. It is a symbolic sign of my great respect for my good friend and our new secretary of HUD that he, of course, will not be asked to be sworn in. Uh, I think this gesture indicates to you the total confidence we have in you, Mr. Secretary. Well, Mr. Chairman, uh, those uh, remarks by you at this moment mean an awfully lot, mean an awful lot to me personally and uh, professionally. And I appreciate very much uh, the confidence that you have expressed and the ranking minority members, as well as uh, my friends on the majority side of the aisle. Uh, the, the metaphors from football to swamps have been uh, overused, um, but uh, in the case today of thinking of uh, quarterbacking, I guess uh, it might be appropriate to think of this as a team effort. Uh, when I said, uh, when I first took the nomination from President Bush that I wanted to make HUD a high-profile agency. I don't think I had this in mind. Uh, all my life, politicians and football players dream of getting on the front page of the newspapers and on evening news, but not the way we have uh, in uh, recent days. But uh, I appreciate very much your confidence and the way you've treated this and both sides of the aisle who have treated the issue with uh, bipartisan concern and respect and uh, a desire to get to the bottom of the problem and move forward in the direction of waging war on poverty and homelessness and despair. And let me just assure you, Mr. Chairman, from the bottom of my heart, in the same spirit with which uh, you have approached these hearings, that I want to in this administration work with the Congress to wage war on poverty and homelessness and despair and the problems of housing and joblessness in our center cities and pockets of rural poverty as well. I am not out to wage war on programs. I'm not out to wage war on policy. I'm not out to wage war on the Congress. I'm not trying to wage war on the goals that have been set for those programs that help needy people and low-income people and low-income neighborhoods and communities throughout this country. You have, my, that, you have that assurance, Mr. Chairman. And I would like to assure, even though he is not here today, the Speaker, who expressed some concern, as he should in his position, about what happens in every agency of the federal government something I told President Bush the other day before he left on his trip to Eastern Europe, that I wanted to work in this administration to accomplish goals for people, uh, for communities, and not be known as a secretary who abandoned uh, the needs that people have throughout this nation. So please tell the speaker that uh, we're going to look independently at every single program. We're going to have the wisdom to make changes, the, hopefully the vision uh, to make reform from top to bottom and from stem to stern of HUD and the programs. 
and it will have the courage to end programs that aren't working. But you can be assured, Mr. Chairman, that I plan to work very carefully with you, this committee, the banking, the other committees that are relevant both in the House and in the Senate. And I want to thank Mr. Schumer and Mr. Wise and Mr. Martinez. Uh, I, I've seen some of the comments that uh, Mr. Frank has made on uh, occasions of the hearings, and I appreciate the approach that he has taken, you, Buzz, and John Kyle, and Chris Shays, and, and Marge Rockema. Um, may I say one other uh, uh, brief uh, statement before I start, Mr. Chairman? Of course. I know next week uh, the pride uh, which you and your wife are going to share in the President's visit to Budapest, and I, uh, I just think what uh, a chill it must give you and your lovely family to see an American President uh, get such a greeting in not only Poland, but in uh, Hungary. And uh, I hope the President has the opportunity, Mr. Chairman, to visit that memorial to Raoul Wallenberg in Budapest, which means so much to you uh, and to those of us who have supported your efforts to recall and to memorialize the life and great work of that righteous Gentile. That uh, I know it means a lot to you. Thank you. Uh, Mrs. Uh, Rockema said it could be a blessing in disguise. Uh, my wife has on our refrigerator door. Now that, as everybody knows, is the single most important notice uh, a bulletin board in any uh, family's home. Uh, a little saying, Marge, that you reminded me of, uh, which was meant, I thought, for my children, but I think was meant more for me. It says that uh, problems are opportunities disguised as insurmountable barriers. Uh, I want to assure you, as well as your colleagues, that I look at HUD that way. And it looks to some like it is something that maybe can't be done. I want you to know that I believe, as does my Undersecretary Al Delabovi and uh, Mary Burnett, my assistant uh, for policy and communications, as well as all the men and women who have yet to be confirmed, Mr. Chairman, the only single employee that I have had an opportunity to appoint who has been confirmed by the United States Senate, Mr. Delabovi, and I am today begging and asking for more help from the Congress in getting through this confirmation process so the outstanding team, we talk about that metaphor of teamwork, uh, I'm willing to work with you, as I have said many times, that I really need help in getting the men and women that I have chosen in President Bush. Mr. Secretary, we, we uh, will give you all the help the we can, Senate. but you understand it is the other body that handles that issue. Well, Mr. Chairman, I'm a pretty good politician myself, and I know how to use a hearing to my advantage. <laughs> 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 and I've got one opportunity to say what has to be said, uh, and I know you can appreciate the fact that we have 13,000 employees and I have been able to confirm one so far. And uh, I'm just uh, asking for help in making sure that the outstanding men and women that I have tried to assemble and President Bush has helped me assemble at HUD Gentleman are available McGill. to work with you and this committee Gentleman in the McGill. very important work. On the way out, Mr. Secretary, they'll all be in 2128 at the banking conference, all five of the top senators you need, so you can just stop off and get them. <laughs> I, may, I may take you up on that, Barney. Um, Chairman Lantos and to the members of the committee on both sides of the aisle, uh, it's no secret that the hearings that you have been holding uh, on the problems at HUD have captured, if not the imagination, at least the interest of lots of folks. As Mr. Schumer mentioned, it is not a Republican or a Democratic cleanup. It is bipartisan. It has to be if we're to have the credibility for the future. I just want to assure all my friends on the left side of the aisle that I uh, want them to know that I approach this from that spirit, so much so that I'm getting accused by some in my own party. Uh, in fact, I saw at the NAACP the other day, someone suggested that if Kemp were ever to run for anything, he'd have to run as a Democrat. Uh, we'll be glad I'm to proud, have you, Mr. Secretary. A, we'll be glad to I'm have you. I'm a very proud Republican, very proud to serve in the Bush cabinet, but I appreciate uh, the relationships that we have built on both sides of this aisle and on this issue. You've done, a, you've done it fairly, Mr. Chairman as Mr. Lukens pointed out, and uh, I, I congratulate you and the committee 
I've learned a lot as well. Uh, um, when I took uh, this job, I made a commitment to the Congress uh, to work with them on what I consider to be that link to the American dream of housing and home ownership and jobs and urban development and opportunity for all people, fair housing, working on the homeless problem, uh, making these dreams reality. And uh, I told you that I wanted to use the full resources of HUD to do so. But it can only be achieved, those goals can only be achieved, Mr. Chairman, as you've pointed out and other members, uh, if there is integrity and efficiency and honesty and fair play and bipartisanship and competitive bidding and contracting on behalf of these great goals. Uh, President Bush has talked many times about what a privilege it is to serve in government. I believe that. Uh, I, take him, I take him very seriously at his word, and he has uh, made all of us aware that he has a high standard, uh, a high code of conduct for us to meet. And we at HUD, Mr. Chairman, uh, want to uh, make sure we live up to that standard as well. I'm not going to allow these problems and our needs to obscure or conflict with fulfilling our objectives for those people who depend upon us. When I became the secretary, I said I wanted to commit my focus and my efforts on the goals of housing and community development, economic growth, and that's what I intend to do. And I uh, really believe, unfortunately, that some folks who have contracted with the federal government here and in defense and in other places give capitalism a bad name. It's a, it's a disappointment to me as a strong believer in democratic capitalism. But nonetheless, I believe with careful monitoring and standards, private enterprise has a good name, uh, not a bad name, in urban America. But let me tell you, Mr. Chairman, those who abuse the system are going to deal with me at HUD from a standpoint of zero tolerance for abusing the poor, abusing the programs, uh, profiting from poverty. I visited a house here in uh, Washington, D.C. recently, and called the uh, developer and the contractor and told him over the telephone long distance that if he weren't moving to clean that place up, which was a HUD-assisted housing community in Washington, D.C., that I would debar him from doing business not only with HUD, but from any agency of the federal government, where they were wasting the taxpayers' dollars, Mr. Chairman, where they were engaging in uh, outright fraud, uh, I was going to make sure that not only the taxpayer was well represented, but more, just as importantly, I should say, the people, the families, the children that are living in either HUD-owned or HUD-assisted housing in America. When I came to uh, HUD in February, the day after Abraham Lincoln's birthday, which meant a lot to me as a Republican and as someone who calls himself a Lincoln Republican, I asked the Inspector General to brief me on all the ongoing audits and problems and investigations within our department. I stressed to him, as I did to all the HUD employees, the pre President Bush's commitment to the highest standards of ethical conduct by every man and woman who administers programs in the name of the public interest. And I want to take this opportunity, Mr. Chairman, to recognize the work and the role of the HUD Inspector General in helping to bring many of these problems to light. We've taken a lot of actions to implement many of the recommendations to help remedy the problems. There are more than 1,900 audits of the IG and recommendations of the Inspector General yet to be resolved. And Mr. Delabobi and our team are moving with dispatch to implement 
the recommendations that have been made not only by the IG, but by some of the very thoughtful questions I want to say to my colleagues in, on this committee out of the hearings. I'm grateful for the work that's been done, not only by the IG, but I'm particularly grateful to all the men and women at HUD who are decent, honorable, hardworking, and who do not deserve to have their good reputation stained by the mistakes of a few. And uh, I did not go to HUD to wage war on them, as I said earlier. I went to HUD with an idea of trying to get them to work with me and vice versa on the goals that we all share for urban America, even though we may disagree on exactly the way to implement those goals. I, I think there's unity, if not unanimity, on making progress in these areas of HUD's goals for America and urban America, as well as rural uh, America. Uh, when the moderate rehab program was brought to my attention, we canceled it. We canceled it. I must admit there was debate over MOD rehab Section 8 program because, frankly, it was doing some things that had to be done and it has, in my view, goals that were of necessity failing to be met. And I, it was with some pain that I canceled the program, or at least the 1989 version of the program, because I felt, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, that I didn't want to hurt those public housing authorities, those people who were doing some rehabilitation work that was very much needed. But it was so fundamentally flawed. It was so systemically poisoned. It seemed to me at the time the only way to get a handle on it as you would want me to get a handle on it, as your, as one of your representatives, uh, was to cancel and then reopen it. We did in June. I think some people have mistook our approach as uh, scorched earth. It's not scorched earth at all, Mr. Chairman. It is a desire to make those programs work. It's been reopened. The program has been changed. It's much more competitive. It's based upon a more equitable distribution to the public housing authorities of the resources available, which are always in short supply. And we tried to correct the deficiencies and make sure that the actions we have taken prevent the abuse of mod rehab in the future. We're uncovering and are correcting and similar program areas, the deficiencies in FHA sales, the co-insurance program, the Title X and Retirement Service Center program. And when I say more will follow, I mean more reform will follow. We're not out, as I would say to my colleagues once again, to wage war on the ultimate goal. We're out to wage war on the abuse of the program. And I have sent to the chair and to each member of the committee a summary of the reforms and the progress to date that we have made. And that's in five months. I'm not bragging or apologizing, but it is a, it's a testimony to the hard work of the men and women that we have assembled at HUD uh, and the high goals that we have for HUD and the zero tolerance I have at HUD for any mistakes, abuses, or lack of accountability in the programs. I will address each of the programs separately. Uh, but some of our most serious problems have come in programs where substantial subsidies are given to the developer. Subsidies, as you have pointed out, Mr. Chairman, that are much greater than the cost of providing decent housing in some cases. In the case of the Mod Rehab Program, for example, HUD was paying 20 to 45 percent more than the rental value of the very apartment itself. The extra money was going for excess profits for the developer and clearly to cover consultant fees. We give the developer a reason to hire a consultant, and we give the successful bidder the money to pay the consultant fees, and it was flawed. It's been changed, and it is being monitored. It's going to be audited, and you can be assured, Mr. Chairman, that this is not the end of our look at Mod Rehab uh, to make sure that it works according to the effort that you have made, Mr. Frank has made, Mr. Shays has made to mention a few, as well as Mr. Conyers, who I saw very 
strong letter to the Black Congressional Black Caucus in which I appeared before last week and made a similar statement uh, in his absence, but I appreciated his memo. It was very, very thoughtfully done, John. I believe in housing programs that help people, not programs that are run for the benefit of the developer or the consultant. We need the private sector. There's no stronger supporter than this secretary, but we, uh, we need developers and landlords and everyone else to be involved in the war on poverty. But we need the programs that help low-income people help themselves and not programs that go into the hands of, of, of greedy people. I think we can do it by shifting the focus more to nonprofits. I think we can do it in public housing to encourage tenant management and tenant control. Uh, I think we can do it by preserving and upgrading the housing we already have. I was in Detroit yesterday for the NAACP. I saw in the morning Detroit News 15,000 houses, public, private, HUD-owned, HUD-assisted houses, boarded up in a state of disrepair and disrepute. And uh, I made a pledge at the NAACP uh, that we wanted to undertake what Mr. Hooks called a clean-up, fix-up, paint-up program involving churches, synagogues, public, profit, uh, private, uh, profit, nonprofit. Every uh, walk of life, we ought to start, I said, in Detroit. Got a big hand in Detroit because I think folks recognized uh, that they wanted to participate in something that was for the collective good, not just their own personal creature comfort. And I was very pleased with the great response that I had yesterday uh, in talking just some common sense to folks who wanted to hear some common sense solution to some of the problems. In this decade, we've increased the number of poor families that are being helped by more than a third. Outlays uh, for assisted housing has increased. That's some progress, at least for those who are getting the assistance, but we must do a better job of providing meaningful housing alternatives to the American people. Faulting pro faulty program design is but one problem. The other is bad management, lack of accountability. And I'm determined, Mr. Chairman, that all the HUD programs will operate without favoritism uh, without Republican or Democratic consultants and for the benefit of the people in need and as I'm fond of saying not those who are motivated by greed. We're going to try to administer them ethically and efficiently, competitively and consistent with the statutory requirements of the United States Congress and where I believe that we can make changes and where we're going to need your help, we're going to come to you, Mr. Chairman. We're going to go to Chairman Gonzalez. We're going to go to Chairman Regal. We're going to go to the men and women of the Congress on both sides of the aisle and suggest reform as we have and as we expect will be coming from not only you, Mr. Chairman, but Mr. Frank and others who have taken such an interest along with Mr. Shays in these types of congressional reform. Um, just a word about mod rehab again. We changed our allocation, as I pointed out. We've changed the selection procedure. We are trying to guarantee to the best of our ability, Mr. Chairman, fair and open competition based upon need. The program, we think, is back on track. I've asked it to be continually monitored by the IG. I am going to have him in my office anytime, any place, any moment in which he sees a problem. He is my request, and Mr. Delabovi's request to flag those programs and to flag those problems and I can assure you that he feels a sense of relief about that request and I feel a strong sense of commitment as does Mr. Delabovi to having that type of a relationship with the IG and we would expect that you too would have that type of a relationship from now on the fair share will mean fair share an equitable share of funding nationwide and not what we call indiscreet discretionary funds, particularly to well-connected consultants. Let them read my lips. <laughs> we want to remove the perception as well as the reality of influence peddling, political favoritism, or any abuse of programs meant for poor folks or low-income communities. The FHA single family sales program has got a lot of attention. We were suffering from, and I say we, meaning we and, and those of us in government who look to the program to continue the fiduciary responsibility of FHA to protect the trust fund. But the system was flawed. 
in that it was designed to ensure not the type of accountability that you would expect from the funds that were received from the sale of these FHA single family properties. The breakdown left the Department of HUD in the past vulnerable to fraud and monetary loss. We've taken some of the steps that you have and your committee has suggested. We've taken some of the ones that the IG has suggested and requested. I will debar from HUD and terminate government-wide business relationships with anybody that abuses these programs as well as the ongoing investigation by the FBI and the Attorney General into the escrow agents who pocketed or embezzled or was lax in their were lax, I should say, and they're sending to HUD the funds that were required to be sent. I've established within the department an asset recovery strike force on behalf of the American taxpayer and the Congress to go into cities where these audits have been completed to recover cash and property that's been embezzled or misapplied. I've asked my General Counsel designate Frank Keating to uh, work with the Attorney General in this regard. We've received a strong commitment from the Attorney General, Mr. Thornburg, and I want to commend him for his prompt efforts. We've instituted a new data system in the property disposition area. I've asked Grant Thornton, an accounting firm, as well as Price Waterhouse, to review our whole system from top to bottom to ensure, help us ensure that it's been designed to help better detect and prevent fraud. I want to clear up one thing about Robin Hood, Mr. Chairman. People who steal from the poor, people who steal from needy programs or needy people's programs are not Robin Hoods. They're not robbing the rich. They're stealing from the taxpayer. And they're depriving low and moderate income folks of the American dream. It's an assault on the integrity of our system. And we've instituted the tighter controls that you would expect of us, Mr. Chairman, and punishment will go forward for any man or woman involved in such activity. The co-insurance program that was troubled HUD's monitoring and enforcement of the multifamily co-insurance program was substandard, inexcusable, badly flawed, and in December this year, the IG reported the serious problems with the underwriting practices out here in Washington, D.C. of DRG, HUD's largest co-insurer. We were shocked, Mr. Chairman, at what DRG had been allowed to get away with. They had a portfolio of over a billion and a quarter of HUD-insured loans. March, I suspended, we suspended, it shouldn't be I, it should be we, we suspended DRG from doing business with the department. The action was essential. Their defaults had equaled $500 million. They had earlier been suspended by Ginny May, and there's no excuse in my view for this action not having been taken earlier. I know you'd agree, the FBI is investigating for fraud and uh, theft and money laundering, and that will go on. We've been through a total review under Austin Fitz and Peter Monroe and other outstanding men and women uh, in our housing department. Suspended two additional co-insurers for non-compliance with HUD procedures, put three more on probation, placed three others on increased oversight status, suspended approval of new co-insurers until we complete our review of the program, and we will not approve, Mr. Chairman, any new co-insurer until they have been demonstra uh, demonstrably, uh, it's been demonstrably evident that they are capable of adhering to the sound business practices that you would expect and we would expect uh, of this uh, very important program. The Section 8 fraud 
We just recently discovered an embezzlement scheme in our Denver regional office in which over a million dollars in Section 8 payments, and you found out, uh, Mr. Chairman, were diverted to a phony account. We suspended the individual without pay, moved to terminate the employment of the employee as alleged to have diverted the funds. In addition, we've hired an outside accounting firm to aid us in revamping that accounting system to frustrate any repeat of this type of criminal uh, action. The Title 10 program, Mr. Chairman, as I wrap up my testimony, uh, the program to provide FHA insurance for land development was originally intended to produce low-risk financing for builders who would develop housing for low- and moderate-income families. In reality, Mr. Chairman, it didn't work that way. It just didn't work that way. It wasn't working for low-income people. Uh, I ordered an examination of the Title X program, directed steps be taken to reform it, and after reviewing the risks and the benefits, I propose, uh, through rulemaking, to terminate it. Uh, the benefit of the program was not reaching the intended low-income beneficiary. It was overwhelmingly designed to benefit upscale developers and consultants. 58, out of 58 loans, Mr. Chairman, uh, Title X programs since 1977, 25 were in default. The direct loss to the department was at $90 million. Uh, it just seems to me that those precious resources should be designed, and I would be willing to work with the committee to make sure those programs go to needy people and needy communities, uh, not to high-priced uh, consultants and uh, developers. I've requested the Office of the Inspector General to audit the entire program, investigate related consultant activity, and examine the circumstances surrounding the process processing of a recently approved development in uh, Northern Virginia. Finally, the last one of some controversy was the Retirement Service Center. July 6th, I canceled, as I did Mod Rehab, new and pending applications for Retirement Service Center funding. This program, too, Mr. Chairman, was designed primarily for low-income persons who were 70 years or older who can live independently and pay market rates for services provided. Instead, it was serving very upper and middle income people and not very well at that. About 30 percent of all the projects that we had approved, I should say were approved at HUD before I got there, had, uh, were in default. Of those which are co-insured, 12 were 12 percent were in default. The direct loss to date was about $120 million with that amount to go a little bit higher, I'm told. An audit report by the IG in one region found evidence of very serious mismanagement and lack of competence on part of the program sponsors. And we found one program in Florida where the so-called uh, elderly uh, in need of income supplements who were paying $2,100 a month for two-bedroom apartments, clearly it was servicing wealthier people, not low-income people. Uh, we intend to publish new rules, let me say to the committee, after we conduct an intensive review of all the existing projects, and uh, while it is impossible to design an insured housing program that is totally free of risk, I want to minimize the risk, better target the assistance under our programs to low-income people and communities they were intended to serve. Finally, on ethics, we're just going to have ethics. Uh, the president, uh, as I said earlier, wants us to have high ethical standards. I know you do, Mr. Chairman, as you have evidenced in your own personal and political career, as does the committee. We will do everything at HUD to work with you. Uh, that's uh, more than you wanted to know, perhaps, but I look forward to responding to your questions. I may need some help. There are more than 50 programs at HUD. I'm uh, looking at every single one of them, but uh, I want you to know that uh, I've got some able people here with me and uh, look forward to responding to the best of my ability and to the best of their ability the very thoughtful questions that you've been presenting to the previous witnesses before this committee. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Secretary, and I formally want to welcome your associates. We are delighted to have you, uh, both uh, Ms. Delabovi and Ms. Burnett. Uh, before uh, I get to my questions, I would like to recognize the very distinguished chairman of the full committee of government operations, who has not only honored us with his presence, but who has given the work of this subcommittee support and backing uh, in every conceivable way, and I publicly would like to express my appreciation to him. I'd like to call on Chairman Conyers. Thank you very much to Tom Lantos and to Barney Frank, uh, Matty Martinez, Bob Weiss, uh, Mr. Shays, Mr. Lukens, uh, all of our friends here. I think the nation owes this subcommittee uh, a vote of confidence 
for the penetrating way that they have examined this subject and developed this uh, recognition of, unfortunately, the swamp that uh, HUD is in. To Jack Kemp, who was with us in my city only yesterday uh, at this 3,000-person uh, turnout of the annual conference of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, I can tell you that your remarks were well received, not only because you were committed, as you have been, and as we know from our collegial experience across more than a dozen years, but because you're bringing fresh commitment and ideas to one of the most sensitive agencies of the federal government that have been so long neglected. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And so I just want to observe that I am personally disappointed in the work of your predecessor. I say this with some reluctance, but I, I think it has to be said. I had no idea when we were meeting and negotiating all through the years that this existed. There were reports in government operations that I think if more of us had examined would have revealed this. Uh, the same thing happened in savings and loan. There were reports coming out of government operations that had more of us heeded earlier, we might have averted uh, some of the problem. Uh, so I'm here to join with this committee to pledge the cooperation that you know you've always enjoyed and hope that we can, can do this without brutalizing the people that might otherwise be made the victims of this, the ironic victims, the people who've been cut out, who suffered, who had their lives affected, who had families disrupted, who had serious decisions about what they would do in a society that seems <coughs> oppressive to them are not made the victims of this. And so I, I will study your statement. Thank you. uh, our doors are open uh, for the continuing communication that you've made clear both in Congress, uh, in your public life, in your private commitment to the advancement of civil rights, uh, that we're going to clean this stuff up and we're with you, you're with us. It doesn't mean that there won't be honest differences of, of, on substantive issues, but one of the problems that this Government Operations Committee has come up, uh, up against time and time again, Mr. Secretary, is that the financial management systems in many of the federal agencies across the board uh, have no tracking mechanisms. Uh, they're, they're out there with millions, sometimes billions of dollars, and, and there are no internal audit systems really worth the name. And so we're going to be working with you to help develop financial management reforms and then to keep those 50 programs that, that you have control of online, to work with you to, to reinvigorate a system of ethics in your department and indeed by your example in the entire federal government. And it's in, in that sense that I'm very proud to join Thank this uh, great subcommittee. Thank the chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. The chair also would like to uh, give an opportunity to our colleague who was on the floor debating a very important piece of legislation to make an opening statement. And I want to express my personal appreciation for the outstanding job he has done both as previous chair of this subcommittee and as a very active member. Congressman Frank. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll give him one more buzz. I appreciate it. And, uh, when we come back from the break, I will be back and forth as well. I know Mr. Morrison and Mr. Schumer is already left because we have the uh, conference on the SNL bill, and I'm sure the Secretary will appreciate it. Uh, Mr. Chairman, to you for the uh, superb job you and the staff have done on this. Uh, I agree we are all very much in your debt. Mr. Secretary, uh, we all appreciate the openness with which you've approached this. I just would like a couple of points picking up on what the Chairman said. The overriding job we have, I think, to do right now is to make sure that this does not become another case of the victims being further victimized. 
programs that were established to help poor people were abused. And it would be a terribly sad irony if out of that came a decision that we weren't going to help poor people further. And Mr. Secretary, you have not been guilty of that, and I appreciate it. I have to say that some of my conservative friends, I think, have been in a somewhat unattractive pose in saying, we did such a lousy job with this that uh, we better dismantle the whole thing. Uh, it's kind of, Congress stopped me before I waste again. And that cannot be allowed to be public policy. We have got the ability to do a better job. And I think one thing ought to be very clear. People have asked, how did something of these dimensions come? There has got to be a certain basic good faith on both sides. And that was lacking in the administrative levels in the previous administration. You simply didn't have people at the top who had a fundamental commitment to the basic program. There is no way that this Congress either can or should try to take over entirely. People have said, how is all this happening? We cannot completely dismantle an executive branch. What we have in the secretary is, I think, a man who is committed to doing the job well. We will have ideological differences as we should. We will debate them as we should. We will, I think, be devoting our resources uh, to helping the public. The secretary mentioned his very commendable goal of getting 15,000 units in Detroit that are in a state of some disrepair back online, I gather. And I commend that. And I, it's also clear to me, for instance, that the voucher program, which will be useful in some ways, is not the way you get 15,000 units back online. You're not going to get 15,000 units fixed up with vouchers. So what I hope we will have is a commitment to a broad range of programs being flexible and with the kind of joint effort that can keep them working well. We'll never make them perfect, uh, but that should not be the standard against which these programs are measured. So both to the chairman and to the secretary, I thank you. Thank you very much. One of our steady guests from the Housing Committee with most effective participation has been Congressman Morrison of, of Connecticut. We're delighted to have you. I'd like to make an opening statement. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Once again, I want to thank you for your leadership and, and for this opportunity to participate. We in the Housing Subcommittee will have an opportunity again tomorrow to hear from the Secretary, and we're looking forward to that. Uh, I think the uh, aggressiveness with which uh, our former colleague has uh, jumped into the fray and, uh, and committed himself uh, to uh, reforming HUD and making the programs effective for the people for which they are entitled uh, intended is, uh, is an extremely important commitment, and uh, I'll have some questions uh, along that line, as each of us will. Uh, but I think the, uh, the good faith on the commitment to the bottom line, which Mr. Frank referred to, is really what is necessary. And when we disagree, uh, that is fine. When statutes are passed and programs are enacted, it, it becomes the responsibility of the leaders of the executive branch to carry them out, even if they disagree with them. And I think that's where the failing occurred in the last administration. We heard from the former secretary that uh, the Mod Rehab program should have been eliminated. And uh, somehow as an excuse that it wasn't eliminated, it could be uh, raided for funds for what was not appropriate. I, I've heard Jack Kemp speak in opposition to that idea and in uh, favor of the rule of law uh, in his agency with those things he agrees with and those things he might not agree with. And I think that is, uh, that is exactly what we're all about here. And uh, uh, we'll look forward to continued cooperative relationship on that basis. Thank you. Mr. Secretary, you are familiar with the two lights there. We have a vote uh, which, uh, which is going on now. We have the committee room available. I know you have right. to make some calls, and right. uh, we'll come back as soon as we cast our vote. Committee will stand in recess. Secretary, <coughs> we want to thank you for most eloquent and comprehensive opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We have a, we have a lot of questions, and let me begin by assuring you that if, in fact, the questions are extremely specific, we certainly do not expect you this afternoon to respond to all of them, but we would be grateful if you get back to us uh, in short order. There are a couple of observations that uh, I'd like to make before asking my first question. Uh, you have made a public commitment again that you are determined to meet the, objects, the objectives and the goals of the program of providing housing for low-income Americans, and we accept that at face value. We understand that your temporary suspension of programs was designed only to redesign them 
and as you demonstrated with the moderate rehabilitation program, you reopened it as soon as possible. Secondly, the chairman would like to associate himself with your comments about the thousands of hardworking and honest and able men and women at HUD. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. They have our respect and our support, and they have been uh, going through a tough period that was not of their own making. Now, Mr. Secretary, all of the problems that we have uncovered fall into a number of categories. One of these is influence peddling, and we'd like to deal with that briefly. One of the problems is lack of controls, lack of attention to managing the agency. But the one I would like to begin with relates to recapturing for the American taxpayer some of the hundreds of millions of dollars that through fraud or embezzlement or inattention uh, have been lost. One of the most uh, remarkable reports of uh, the Inspector General dealt with the question of refinancing subsidized loans. If I may refresh your memory, uh, Mr. Adams reported to your predecessor that if he were to proceed with refinancing subsidized loans, some $844 million could be saved for the American taxpayer. And basically, the rationale behind Mr. Adams' uh, recommendation, and he's in the audience and he's uh, free to comment or expand on my understanding of this, but basically Mr. Adams' proposal ran as follows. And low-income people who qualify for this program uh, get a mortgage uh, they are obliged to pay only a certain interest rate. Let us, for the sake of the argument, say 9%. And if the market rate, as the mortgage is taken out, is extremely high, let us say 17%, which was the case earlier in the decade, then the federal government agrees to subsidize that mortgage between the 9% that the homeowner pays and the 17% that the bank gets. Right. Now, one would think that as market rates for mortgages decline, say from 17% to 10%, <laughs> Secretary Pierce would have gladly followed up on Mr. Adams' suggestion and would have refinanced that loan so the government subsidy, instead of being eight percentage points, would have been only one percentage point. For reasons that boggle my mind, the previous administration in HUD did not act on Mr. Adams' very fine suggestion. This morning, this noon actually, Mr. Secretary, I introduced H.R. 2850 uh, with my distinguished colleague, Mr. Shays, number of members of uh, this subcommittee, Mr. Martinez, Mr. Frank, others have uh, agreed to co-sponsor it. My understanding is many members of the Housing Committee will sponsor it. And tomorrow I plan to speak on this on the floor. What HR 2850 will do, I am just becoming part of your asset recovery task force, that if we move on this very fine suggestion that Mr. Adams made years ago, at which time the government could have saved $840 million, if we move on it now, according to the Inspector General's office, we could still save $391 million. That's significant money. I'm not asking you to comment at this moment on whether you endorse this legislation or not, because that would be unfair. I want you to study it, I want you, your legal staff to study it. But I would like to ask you to get back to me at the earliest possible reasonable time to indicate what your position is on this. Because here it seems to me we have a blatant waste of taxpayer funds, which common sense would indicate could be stopped, the hemorrhaging of taxpayer dollars. 
We now have a legislative vehicle to achieve that goal. And it is my very strong hope, Mr. Secretary, that both you and the administration in general will be able to get behind my legislation so at least we can save $390 million on this one item. Would you care to comment? Well, let, me, let me briefly uh, comment, Mr. Chairman, that both you as well as Mr. Shays, your co-sponsor, and to the other members of the committee, uh, there is no one uh, more interested in saving uh, the taxpayers of America uh, more money than this secretary, A. I believe this is an administration that would look forward to working with you on legislation to effectuate savings uh, for the taxpayer. Some of the variables that are introduced into this equation are how many homeowners would participate, what are the market interest rates at the time. Of course, you pointed out that the savings have, uh, would be somewhat different from the original 800 uh, million. I support the thrust of your legislation. I would like to comment on it. Uh, after my staff and I have had a chance to look at all of the many uh, questions and thoughtful questions you've raised, but very frankly, I, I uh, uh, wholeheartedly support the thrust of the idea behind uh, legislation. We want to make savings, and uh, I would hope that we could come up with legislation that would satisfy both uh, the interests of uh, uh, the thoughtful uh, members who have introduced it, as well as an administration that wants to save money. So I, I agree with uh, the effort. Uh, let's not forget, though, that there are a lot of variables that are and have to be introduced into this equation before we can tell people that we have saved this or that much. But uh, I applaud uh, the thrust of the question and the goals you have outlined. Well, I appreciate Ms. Secretary. And I will answer for the record uh, within a short period of time. We, we appreciate that fully. Now, one of the things, uh, Ms. Secretary, that knowing you, I know you don't like to do, and that is to <laughs> criticize others this is a congenitally unpleasant exercise for you and i respect that uh, it's not pleasant for me either and we would all like to put this whole matter behind us have the swamp drained and move on to building better housing for for the american people but unless we clearly understand what happened, and unless we clearly fix responsibility, which of course has been, in my view, one of the principal failures of your predecessor, an unwillingness to assign responsibility to hold people accountable, we really will not have learned from this painful experience, and we'll be in, in danger of repeating it. So let me begin by raising some questions concerning uh, the role of Secretary Pierce. You have uh, now uh, stated on a number of occasions in, in recent days, and I'm quoting from page three of your testimony today, what I could not anticipate three months ago was the extent to which <coughs> I had inherited, inherited a legacy of abuse and mismanagement, fraud and favoritism in certain hot programs. What you're really saying is that the scope of this mess uh, was unanticipated by you, and indeed unanticipated by, by any of us. Can you tell us at this stage whom you hold responsible for the mess you inherit? <laughs> Well, Mr. Chairman, let me say, if I don't clean it up, I'll be responsible. And if it isn't, doesn't happen under President Bush, he would be responsible. And I've got to let the chips fall where they may in terms of uh, establishing the credibility of HUD and the Bush administration's approach to housing programs for poor uh, people in this country. And uh, I said in answer to a question by network television last week at the press club when I was addressing 400 outstanding young college leaders from all over America that, uh, frankly, any administration, 
uh, has to be held accountable and is accountable uh, to the American people and to the pages of the history books for how programs are run during their stewardship of these fiduciary responsibilities that we have to the American people. And I think that speaks uh, volumes about uh, previous administrations, plural, um, and it speaks uh, eloquently, I hope, about my responsibility uh, in this administration to change the practices that were allowed to take place uh, over all too many years. I don't feel comfortable uh, uh, on national television and in front of congressional committees uh, pointing the finger. On, uh, uh, you're right, it is a congenital fault of mine. Um, but I think it is important for people to know that we are not just cursing the darkness, we are lighting some candles, we are changing the way practices have been carried out at HUD, we're reforming it from STEM to STERN, and that should also speak to the past practices that have been abused. So I think my statement uh, uh, stands on its own, Mr. Chairman. Um, I do not want to uh, uh, hurt uh, innocent people, I think. But uh, Mr. Secretary, innocent people have been hurt. I mean, the, the estimates now run to into the billions of dollars that the American taxpayer will have lost. And I am not, uh, uh, I'm not interested in a blanket condemnation of your predecessor. I am merely asking you, is it believable that your predecessor did not know that all this abuse and all this blatant favoritism was going on during the eight years of his administration? Well, look, the IG uh, reports to the Congress, it reports to the uh, previous secretary, and the reports that were given to me uh, prompted me to act. I think uh, that speaks to my uh, willingness to change the way HUD has been uh, administered and managed and... Uh, All right. Uh, uh, now, look, it is clear, it is clear that by definition, uh, I have been critical of the practices and uh, people who allowed programs to be mismanaged at HUD in the past. Now, if you just want me, I know you don't, uh, but uh, I hope that my statement is not uh, taken as uh, a whitewash. It, it is not. I think you know that I would not whitewash. I've been critical of the previous secretary. Uh, critical of the, of the, how the programs were managed. I have never uh, uh, failed to criticize my s uh, Congress when I was in the Congress, but I think it's very important, Tom, Mr. Chairman, excuse me, I think it's very important that the American people uh, get some perspective, as I know you want them to get out of these hearings. And I want them to see HUD going forward. Uh, we're going to go forward on simultaneous tracks of reform and uh, meeting the goals of, of uh, the needy and the low-income communities of America. And it just, um, uh, I, I've seen a lot of press articles about what I've said and what I haven't said, and some of my friends want me to abolish uh, HUD. Uh, some of my friends want to genuflect to every program that's ever been designed. I think we've got to have the courage and the wisdom and the perspicacity to look at these programs and to look at the people who've administered them and call the shots as they uh, should be called. And I pledge you I will do that. But I, uh, I just would not rather, I would rather not today uh, uh, do anything other than to tell you I think it was run uh, in shipshod fashion. I think there were mistakes made. I think the previous secretary was a decent and honorable and honest man. Uh, at the same time, I think uh, it was managed very poorly and I'm going to make changes. Now, that's, I don't want to... to uh, that, takes, okay. that, that takes care of my... my We're case. going to make wholesale changes in HUD. Now, that ought to speak volumes about how I feel it was run in the past. It does. It 20 does. years. <laughs> One of the things that... Uh, <laughs> One of the things that uh, I find very interesting in your testimony is your very powerful statement about the so-called consultants who use their influence. On page four of your testimony, 
Mr. Secretary, you say the following, paragraph four. Some of our most serious problems have come in programs where substantial subsidies are given to developers, subsidies that are much greater than the cost of providing decent housing. In the case of Mod Rehab, for example, HUD paid from 20 to 44 percent more than the rental value of the apartments. That extra money goes for excess profits for the developer and clearly to cover consultant fees. We give the developer a reason to hire a consultant and we give the successful bidder the money to pay the consultant's fees. That's your testimony. I fully agree with it. When former Secretary of the Interior James Watt testified before this committee under oath, he repeated ad nauseum and ad infinitum that not a dime of federal taxpayers' money, state taxpayers' money, county taxpayers' money, city taxpayers' money ever went to him as a consultant. In your judgment, is that an accurate statement? I think I, would, I was watching on C-SPAN when you held uh, the hearings uh, with regard to the uh, subject uh, of uh, consultants, and uh, uh, I, th I, 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 I agree with you, Mr. Chairman, that a dollar is a dollar is a dollar is a dollar, and that uh, the programs, uh, while in a narrow interpretation, it could be said that it came from the developer, you and I both know that there is really only one dollar, and it may be uh, uh, the cost to the taxpayer was enormous, and the benefit to the consultant was uh, enormous, and we're going to make Mod Rehab work, and we're going to make it work for the customers of Mod Rehab, i.e. the poor, not the consultants, and uh, you have my pledge to get consultants out of the Mod Rehab program. I've got nothing uh, against a consultant per se. But the way this program was run, uh, it was a per se violation of the type of conduct that we would like in these programs. And I pledge to you, as I did earlier today, we're going to remove the need for consultants by reforming this uh, program. Well, we have tried to differentiate between legitimate technical consultants who had something of substance to advise on and people who engaged in influence peddling. You on, uh, on page 14 of your testimony make the following statement, Mr. Secretary. We will not show favoritism to those whose only expertise or interest in housing and community development is pulling strings at HUD. Um, do I understand from this statement that in your view, some of the so-called consultants who appeared before this committee really had no consulting expertise to offer except their ability to pull strings at heart. I think some of them told you yes. The answer that I would give is yes, and I think the answer that they gave was yes. You have spoken this morning of troubled cities, and um, we contacted your staff and asked them which of those cities that you, which are the, the cities that you have in mind that you have targeted for special investigation. I want to be sure that this list of cities that we have from your staff has your approval. Uh, we have been given two sets of lists. One, the ones that are primary targets of your investigation, which are New Orleans, Houston, Los Angeles, and Denver. And on the secondary target list, Atlanta, Birmingham, Indianapolis, Fort Worth, Buffalo, and Washington, D.C. Are we to understand, Ms. Secretary, that at the present stage of your inquiry, these are the cities where your people find the most serious problems in HUD programs. I believe, Mr. Chairman, that you're talking about the problem that we had with uh, closing agents. Yes. 
Those are the cities in which we... Not just with closing agents. We were given these as targeted cities, troubled cities, cities where HUD well, is intensifying its investigation. The, uh, the Attorney General is looking into uh, a lot of cities. Uh, the FBI is looking at uh, several uh, cases of alleged uh, criminality. There have been uh, several reports in the newspaper uh, from all the way from Robin uh, Hud uh, to the problem of embezzlement in, a, in the Denver office. Uh, we've suspended uh, uh, people who used to work uh, for Hud. Uh, we have asked the Inspector General to uh, get more closely involved in conducting the audit of the high volume Hud offices. We've established, as I alluded to earlier in my testimony, an asset recovery team led by my General Counsel designate uh, Frank Keating to go into a number of cities. Uh, we've started debarment proceedings against some title companies. Uh, there's a number of cities, I guess, that would be considered troubling. I don't know that are in trouble. I don't know that uh, I have uh, in front of me the same list that you have, I, for which I would apologize, but uh, everybody is scrambling back here to give me. Uh, and I, I, I would rather not have a headline in, in each city saying, uh, you know, Kemp uh, named. Uh, 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 Los Angeles or Buffalo as the troubled city. There's just a number of troubled programs and, and throughout HUD, and I would say on a generic basis, we had to allude to the or, or uh, address the problem from the basis of the program, not trying to uh, uh, attack the city per se. I, I know you're not doing that either, uh, but let me say it probably goes further than the names of the cities that you uh, uh, suggested in your uh, in the in the premise of your question. But I will uh, just getting a note. Uh, I would be happy, Mr. Chairman, to give you the specific uh, problem areas and cities that you have asked for. But I wanted to make sure that you know that I understand how many troubled parts of the country there might be, I didn't want to unnecessarily uh, have an inference drawn that I was suggesting that this city was worse than that city. I understand okay. you. Now, we also received information from your staff, Ms. Secretary, in response to my question that nine title companies have been debarred from doing business with your agency. I won't read the list, but Without objection, I will place them in the record. We were advised that you have suspended three co-insurers. One of them you mentioned in your testimony, DRG. DRG, which was suspended in March. Then Puller was suspended in April. And Southwest Funding Group in May 15. Uh, can you tell us, do you expect to suspend any other co-insurers? Uh, did you mention the three, uh, that I placed yes. three? on probation. Which there are three that you placed on six months probation. They would require a HUD pre-approval uh, bec uh, before another commitment. There are three that have been placed on a quote unquote special watch status uh, that were in May placed on that status. We placed a moratorium on, on any new co-insurers that enter uh, the program uh, under uh, the leadership of uh, our new housing commissioner designee, uh, des designate uh, Austin Fitz, uh, we've developed a, we think, a sophisticated uh, computerized uh, tracking system for all the new commitments. And uh, we have commenced an exhaustive consultation process to obtain recommendations for program changes and look forward to working with this committee. And it's possible that there might be other suspensions. I'd, uh, I'm very careful. What? Yeah, if, if we were to find reasons, uh, I am not above, uh, as I have tried to point out in the short time that we've been there, and uh, under the type of leadership that I think we have uh, at HUD, that we're not uh, at all uh, opposed to uh, suspending uh, someone, but I want to make sure it's for a good cause, and I know the committee does as well. It's an important program. We want to make it work. But DRG was grossly uh, mismanaged, uh, as was uh, some others. Ms. Secretary, you have uh, received uh, from this subcommittee, from both sides of the aisle, a degree of uh, 
encouragement and support and commendation which must border on the embarrassing. So let me let me it's not at all embarrassing. <laughs> let me move to a let me Serve move to an arena. Let me move to an arena where uh, perhaps there might be some difference. Mr. Chairman, I don't take lightly what is said. I don't take lightly. I do not take lightly what you have said and what your colleagues have said, and I appreciate it very much. We have I said it in all sincerity. You, uh, you, means uh, a lot to me. We hope we when will you, live up to When it. you clean up hard, and notice I didn't say if you clean up hard, <laughs> I said when you clean up hard, yes. you, will you will still be confronted with a gigantic problem, and let me tell you what that is. No one questions your sincerity in terms of your best efforts to provide decent housing for the millions of American individuals and families who at present, without assistance, cannot do this for themselves. But that will take very significant resources, way above the resources you currently have at HUD's disposal. Now, I am prepared to stipulate that some creative restructuring of programs, better targeting, lots of things, can assist you in moving in that direction. But quantitatively, you will still be miles away from beginning to meet the demand. The question I have is, are you prepared to fight for housing within the administration? Or do you feel obligated to defend whatever resources the administration's budget next year and the year after will provide for this enormously important arena? You realize that housing is the most pressing domestic economic problem of, uh, of most Americans. Uh, when, uh, when we started our families, uh, you much after me, but nevertheless people were talking about devoting 25% uh, of your take-home pay to, to your housing needs. You know how many Americans are devoting 50% and more. You realize how many working families cannot begin to think of uh, owning a home or renting a home. Are you prepared to put up a major fight within the administration for additional resources. Mr. Chairman, you don't need to ask that question. You know exactly a priori what the answer to your question is. Uh, uh, you know I'm a fighter, and I'm going to fight for uh, uh, housing and first-time home buyers and home ownership and cleaning up public housing and sheltering the homeless and uh, bringing high ethical standards to HUD and enforcing the fair housing laws. and urban economic development and rural economic development. Mr. Chairman, I am a fighter. Am I going to support the administration's budget request? You bet, because I am also on a team and we're trying to build uh, a, uh, uh, a record in this administration of which uh, Mr. Bush can be proud and of which uh, our friends on the, the Democratic side of the aisle can be uh, proud. I, we may find some differences along the way and that is going to be all to the good. I think this country can stand a debate over housing. I'd like to show you, if I had it today, my chart of some of the bureaucracy that people and, and uh, uh, builders have to go through, <coughs> excuse me, to build a house in uh, Southern California or Northern California or, or any place. There's a lot of things that need to be done. And I am gonna try to have uh, both the wisdom uh, uh, of, of this collective effort as well as the courage of my convictions to criticize programs that don't work and support programs that do work. I'm going to obey the law. I am going to work with you and uh, Mr. Gonzalez, as I have told Chairman uh, Regal and uh, Alan Cranston and uh, so many members of your side as well as members of my side. We, we, we ought not to uh, just think of this, though, as more federal dollars. Federal dollars uh, need to be spent on rehabilitation. The CAP monies, I have testified, need to be increased. Uh, uh, I think the Mod Rehab Program can be reformed and be made to work for people without uh, uh, giving the money to uh, high-priced uh, consultants. But direct payments to poor people have increased in the last uh, seven years. Uh, I'm not, I said to, uh, well, on my confirmation hearings, I didn't want to be the secretary of vouchers. I probably made some of my friends on the right mad at me, but I don't think, 
I, I support vouchers, but I don't want to be the secretary of vouchers alone. I think it can be a tool to empower the poor, to help the uh, low-income uh, citizen to be a, uh, a purchaser, to be a consumer, to shop around, to have the freedom of choice, to have the portability that goes with a, with a voucher. Uh, let me read you one. Excuse me. I'm not trying to, uh, to, to uh, divert attention, but I was at the National Press Club giving that speech to young leaders. I thought they were all college age. And a, a young woman said, Mr. Kemp, I want to tell you and privately. Now, here I am on national television uh, reading her letter, but I think she wouldn't mind if I read it uh, four days later. She said, I want to tell you privately that I'm a 30-year-old single mother. I've got three jobs, one child. I live on under $475 a month because of student loans and some HUD subsidized apartment help, i.e. A, a, a voucher. I uh, am now in college, I'm a senior, and I've been chosen by my college as the uh, recipient of the National Young Leader uh, Award to go to Washington and spend five days in Washington listening to both sides of uh, all of these questions get articulated. And she said, uh, it's changed my entire life. Now, I'm a Republican who believes that we need a ladder upon which all men and women can climb to the highest of their ability, irrespective of their race, color, or condition. But I want you to know that I am also a Republican who believes firmly in the net under which people should not be allowed to fall, that there are disadvantaged and disabled and impaired and unfortunate folks in our society who might have been left behind or left out, who are some considered to be the least or last or lost, and they need our help. And whether it's a guaranteed loan to go to college to develop your potential as an academic student or whether it is a uh, a, a, a voucher to help uh, someone become empowered or whether it is to go out and rehabilitate Kenilworth Parkside or Carr Square or Bromley Heath or uh, I shouldn't start mentioning housing communities because it would be unfair to the, uh, the hundreds of thousands of people but I want to assure you I am a fighter and I am willing to fight for programs and to fight for uh, uh, the goals and uh, you can be assured sir that not only will I fight for more effort from the federal government, I think the banks and the thrifts and the pension plans of America and the profits and the nonprofits and the private sector and the labor unions and churches and synagogues of America had better get busy and start making democracy work in these communities or it ill behooves the United States of America to tell Polish steel workers and shipyard workers and students in Tenement Square that we know that democracy will work for them. I can assure you that I will fight for that, and I can assure the president I'm going to be a good team player and support his budget. How's that for a... That's, that's a pretty good answer. How's that for cover else? <laughs> <laughs> Congressman Lucan. Chairman, it's always a uh, source of great enthusiasm <laughs> and uh, morale building to hear the secretary address uh, any group, but specifically this group. Mr. Secretary, I have been uh, really stunned by some of the revelations that came out of this because how I'm, while many of us uh, want to support some areas of government, we've always been able to point to areas that have been total failures and where corruption has existed. And we find that, lo and behold, a uh, committee and subcommittee in which we sit, thanks to the vigorous prosecution of this, uh, uh, of this situation by our chairman and now by the full committee, I think the full extent, the breadth and the width of this, this tragedy has unfolded to the nation, but specifically before the U.S. Congress. To the point, of all the programs that you have, the major six points you, you made in your uh, remarks, which I've been able to peruse at least, although not study, which of the programs, and I hate to put you on the spot, but that's why you're here, which of these programs can you turn around the quickest, in your opinion, given current funding and current authority? Is there any immediate hope where we can point to something or we can point to the poor people of America and say, look, there are programs at work, and this administration and this Congress, with its support, can, can make it work. And, and conversely, since I know that you are not given to short answers, part two, what's going to be the toughest job? What area is going to be the longest in terms of recovery time? Well, what comes okay. to mind is mod rehab. Quickly, uh, we uh, acted swiftly on the IG's report. We shut it down. We caused a lot of gnashing of the teeth and heartburn in uh, several public housing authorities around the country, and it was not done to be anti-PHA or anti-anybody uh, or any city, but it was designed to get the program back on track, and we got it back on track, and I got to really pay my respects to my 
folks uh, at HUD who did one heck of a job, both those who are career and those who are political appointees. Very proud of, of, of that. Uh, we started a program in, um, in uh, uh, Overtown. Uh, I shouldn't say we started in Overtown. We announced it in Overtown. We put out a NOFA so that any town or city can apply called Operation Bootstrap. It was uh, the old uh, program of uh, se Operation Self-Sufficiency that had been started. We re revised it. We uh, uh, took uh, uh, vouchers and took uh, this uh, program and announced it in Overtown to try to help those single parent families, uh, particularly uh, helping women move through the transitional phase of their life from welfare to gainful employment uh, with a variety of services that we wanted to encourage cities to provide, i.e. Uh, job training, better targeted uh, JTPA, uh, the child care uh, facilities that are necessary, and. Uh, uh, other social services that have been lacking. So th those are uh, uh, a couple of things I can point to real quickly, among other things. We, we stopped, uh, we only stopped the, um, uh, the Retirement Service Center program as we did Mod Rehab to try to get it reformed, as I said earlier. And I think Mr. Foley needs to know, as I will tell him on the phone later today when I get a chance to call him, uh, that uh, my, uh, uh, I, this is not an attempt to uh, use uh, problems at HUD as a subterfuge to get rid of worthwhile goals or programs or policies, but I'm going to have the uh, tenacity, if you will, to push forward on reform and folding them in where necessary, and, and I will consult as I will, as I've been doing with uh, this committee and, and other relevant committees. Objection. Does changing the regulations for eligibility become a big factor or an insignificant factor in terms of bureaucratic application and speeding up the process for those eligible? Okay, can you, the regulations change within, is that a major factor at all? Has that been a stumbling block for many people? I didn't hear program? the first uh, part of your question, I'm sorry. In terms of moderate rehab, yeah. specifically, to which I think you just addressed your comments, uh, can regulation change speed up the process for eligibility for those deserving? Well, we changed them, uh, I would say to the gentleman from Ohio. We changed them very quickly. Uh, I think in less than two, it took us about two months. I'm not bragging on myself as much as I'm bragging on uh, the team uh, that, did, uh, uh, that changed uh, regulations and put out a much fairer uh, process by which uh, public housing authorities and cities around the country would feel like their needs were being concerned, uh, were taken into concern to a greater degree than they had prior to the, to the reform. So on that basis, uh, I felt uh, that we did a, uh, the, my team did a very good job. Uh, I think it's also important to point out to the gentleman uh, from Ohio, as well as uh, our chairman from California, that uh, uh, FHA financed about 450,000 new first-time homebuyers. Uh, last year. That program is working. There's taken a lot of hits and heat and a little bit of heat recently, but uh, I am convinced, as the gentleman from California is convinced, FHA is really playing a, a, a very important role in the process by which uh, we get folks into uh, home ownership, and it's something that this secretary feels is inextricably linked to the American dream. So I, I, I say to to you, Mr. Lukens, that we are we can make some of those regulation changes rather rapidly. Some will take more time, and I guess it would depend on the program you and the problem. Would you address co-insurance briefly? Uh, the losses there seem to be uh, irretrievable. Are they indeed? Are they uh, irretrievable? Irrecoverable. Well, th there there were some losses that uh, are going to be. Uh, you know, there has been an, a, a loss uh, of monies that is. Uh, irretrievable. I think by taking the swift action that we took, I would say uh, to the gentleman, uh, we have suspended uh, or stopped the hemorrhaging. It was, it was indeed hemorrhaging. And I'm, again, this is another area uh, in which I'm very proud of the people that we have in housing at HUD and throughout HUD. Uh, we stopped the hemorrhaging, let me say, and I am convinced that we can get it back on the right track. So the co-insurance program can play a role uh, as a tool uh, in the overall objectives of uh, the housing needs of the American people, but it needed a dramatic, I don't want to say drastic, because I don't like that word, but a dramatic change in the operation 
and uh, we have stopped the hemorrhaging and we're going to put it on the right track. A quick question on the IG, the powers and responsibility of the in-house HUD IG. Um, it seems to me that the responsibility of the IG and HUD was fixed through previous administrations and that the responsibility was uh, statutory as well as in-house regulatory. However, the power to act in, in some cases seemed to escape the occupant uh, even as early as the uh, original IG. Is there any way to beef up or increase the enforcement capability of the IG or have you built something in in terms of the early warning system that he must come to you uh, as a means of rules and inform you of a situation before any action can be taken? How will you handle the new powers, if any, of the and the accountability of the Inspector General's office in HUD? Well, I said earlier in answer to a previous question by Mr. Lantos, Chairman Lantos, that I thought the management of HUD was uh, uh, in disrepair and that I was going to make and have made, and we are making, dramatic changes in management techniques. And I guess it is important, in fact, I believe it is important to mention that uh, accountability, uh, requiring of your people absolute integrity with regard to how they administer a program, uh, listening to your IG, and that comes not only on my behalf, but on behalf of the Congress as well. Uh, as I told you, or said earlier in answer to a previous question, I told Mr. Adams, our IG at uh, HUD, that I want him to come, I want, my door was open. In fact, I don't even close the door. Huh. I, I do not close that door. In other words, I want that door to be open to anybody at HUD who feels that they have something I need to hear. Obviously, that's got to be done with, with uh, uh, prudence and, and responsibility, but I want the HUD IG to come in and or to call me on the phone. And there's a hotline between he and I, uh, and he uses it and I use it. Uh, but I don't want to give the impression, I don't want to give the American people the impression that we cannot get this thing on the right track. It's very important that they have confidence that there are changes that are being made, practices are being modified and reformed, and we are going to move forward, and I'm not going to let this problem be turned into an impediment. I'm going to do what Mrs. Rockema talked about, uh, uh, turn it into a great opportunity to bring about reforms of U.S. housing programs on behalf of uh, the people. Mr. Chairman, I wonder if the gentleman yeah, would I mean, yield uh, on, on particularly that point, because this has been troubling to me as a, a member of the committee, that is the, uh, the precision or lack of precision with which the, uh, the law requires the reporting of the IG uh, to be made both to the head of the department, the secretary, it, whether your department or any other department. Uh, and also to the Congress, because I think that has been troubling to a number of us, particularly someone like myself who has sat on the committee, and yet um, seemingly unaware of some of these critical problems that have shown up in terms of the recommendations for simple auditing. I mean, it seems so obvious now. And I just wondered if the Secretary, following up on uh, Joan from Ohio's question, if the Secretary feels there are fundamental corrections in the law that would require a uh, more specific transmittal of these reports to the committees of jurisdiction as well. I don't know what the Secretary's observations are based on his experience thus far. Well, uh, I don't have any problem with that idea, and uh, very frankly, whether it's uh, codified in law or uh, by letter between uh, uh, this committee and the IG of, uh, of the relevant uh, agencies of the federal government, I, I, I believe that is uh, very important, and I uh, applaud uh, uh, the gentlelady from New Jersey's uh, uh, suggestion. Uh, we're going to do it without uh, any change in law, but I applaud uh, the concept of uh, the gentlelady's uh, legislative proposal. If I might <coughs> wrap up with one question that's been rather triggered, actually, by a, a Congresswoman Rokema's question. Is there any way that it's under consideration at the present time by you or your staff to create the semblance of a red alert system for a GAO report that spots a problem.
problem or an internal HUD IG report that spots a problem um, by virtue of simply uh, signing off at a certain level and, and bucking it immediately up. And let me add, tell you why I <clears throat> just suggest this and think of it. I chaired the banking uh, committee on uh, the SNL crisis in Ohio and uh, of course authored the legislation to solve our problem. We had the home state collapse, the SNL, which prefaced uh, uh, the national program by about six years. And we found out that nobody assumed responsibility or had to take responsibility for the simple reason there was an absence of either initial or name at any state of review, at any uh, level of review authorities. Nobody signed anything. And while both <coughs> under Democrat and Republican governors alike, identically, the same system worked to preserve everyone's political right. hide and that nobody could remember briefing the governor and the governor could recall being briefed. I mean, it was just, it was just total chaos because there's no simple <coughs> system of signatory accountability where you get this red alert and it just went through three yeah. levels of supervision. Everybody said, gee, I, I right. told so-and-so, but nobody right. could remember telling. So just having come that experience, can you tell me what kind of system is in place now well, if such an alert should be sounded? Well, I think uh, you put your finger on one of the most important um, warning signals to any member of Congress or head of an agency, which is that when that bell goes off, when that alarm is uh, sounding, when those calls are being made, how you respond is, is, is really the key determinant of what type of a manager, what type of a leader, what type of responsibility, what type of a responsible uh, citizen you are. And I guess ultimately it depends on the type of people we choose to surround us, uh, surround ourselves with. I'm, I, I've said earlier that I feel very confident, and I think this committee on both sides of the aisle would feel very confident of the men and women that uh, I and President Bush uh, have chosen to uh, lead HUD at this uh, given moment in history. I'm very proud of many of the of, of the people there at HUD. They, there really are some good and, and decent and, and very honest uh, men and women there. Uh, uh, but as of May, uh, Mr. Lukens, as of May uh, 1989, there were 11 audit reports, 28 recommendations that were over six months old. Uh, management decisions had not been made. Um, there were many losses that were occurring to the taxpayer that I know that you and the chairman would be uh, 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 profoundly uh, concerned about. Um, there had been over 840 reports, uh, uh, 3,589, Mr. Delabovi tells me, uh, recommendations, uh, <laughs> monies that were due HUD, uh, in, in an incredible challenge to all of us and uh, I'm not going to go into all the great work that we've done and in the sense that uh, it sounds so uh, uh, self-serving to say that uh, we're, we've got a handle on it but I think we do I want you to know I want the chairman to know I want the American people to know that uh, <laughs> we are uh, getting a handle on this uh, I think uh, the swamp I'm sorry the swamp thing ever got used, uh, because it is not a swamp at HUD. It is no way a swamp. Uh, there were problems, and there were pockets of real serious uh, deficiencies, and certainly many of the cases that this committee has brought to the attention, and wisely so, Mr. Chairman, uh, in my opinion. But uh, uh, HUD is, uh, is going to work. <laughs> it's open for business. Uh, it'll, it'll we work. are doing things. And I, I would like just, I'm sorry, I would like Mr. Delabobi, if you didn't mind, just to take a moment, Mr. Chairman, uh, to, to, I have appointed Al, uh, as well as uh, our general counsel, Frank Keating, Steve Britt, and others, uh, to be very much involved in changing these management practices, as have all the assistant secretaries. Uh, just, just take a moment, Al, and, and uh, share with the committee some of the things that uh, you uh, uh, are doing. Thank you, Mr. Secretary, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. Surely. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, the Secretary has directed that one of my key assignments as Undersecretary will be to ensure that the recommendations produced by departmental audits are considered by management. Uh, and in this follow-up role, my objective is going to be to take whatever measures are necessary. Uh, in my experience in other departments, the key thing is the involvement of the Secretary 
uh, and this secretary is involved, making it known to those to whom the audit recommendations fall that he wants follow through, that 846 open reports are not acceptable, that 3,589 recommendations are not acceptable, that 1,940 recommendations laying around for over a year uh, that have been accepted but not implemented are not acceptable. And it is this sense of commitment uh, that will enable us to turn the, uh, the corner. And I can assure you that my colleagues, who are anxiously awaiting confirmation, are anxious as well to get busy on this task uh, and manage it to uh, completion. I thank you very much, Mr. Delamovi. Congressman Martinez. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I guess the questioning period for each of the members of the panel start out by a statement and then subsequent four minutes of statement, one minute of question. And I'll follow suit. Uh, not so badly, though. But I do so because two of the five poorest cities in the country are in my district. I represent. Now, early on in my uh, initial term of Congress, initial full term of Congress, I had the opportunity to try to deal with HUD in uh, obtaining uh, help and technical advice uh, for that uh, city. And it wasn't easy. And I'll go back to something I'm going to say now. Part of the problem was the consultants that the city hired, and I agree with you totally about consultants in this business. <coughs> but uh, since that time, uh, and since you've actually been in office, I've had the opportunity again to require the assistance of HUD. And I'm going to tell you, quite honestly, uh, there was a difference. There was a greater cooperation, and, a, and the attitude uh, was better. And I think maybe that might be a tribute uh, to you and uh, the people that you've surrounded yourself with. Uh, I understand uh, that they probably understand now the office is occupied. It wasn't occupied before, and that's the problem. It goes back to what Mr. Lucan said about red, uh, red lights. I think the red lights were always there. The attor attorney general's, uh, the IG, rather, uh, reports were those red signals. The trouble is that past secretary, if he read them, and I doubt that he read them. And of course, it's only my own opinion. Uh, uh, well, not only my own opinion, because I remember testimony to the fact that the IG went to him and told him about certain reoccurring problems and, and warned him about those red light flags that, uh, or red flags that were out there. And he seemed indifferent, uh, that he didn't see the problem or that uh, uh, it wasn't something that was that uh, much to worry about. And so I think the big difference is someone who cares and someone who has pride in the kind of a job he does, which I'm confident that you have, uh, in, in regards to somebody that doesn't. And that's the whole problem there. But uh, I'm, uh, I'm concerned more about uh, the suspension of programs that provide help to really deserving people. And I'm wondering why we can't uh, continue those programs uh, setting policy within the department that says, look, these are what these programs were intended to do. Uh, you have a long history of being involved with a lot of these programs being passed in Congress while you were there. You know very well what the intent was. Saying to those people, as a matter of your policy, that you will now carry these programs out the way they're intended. Now, I understand that this is a, a, a mammoth problem, a multifaceted problem, where you have to one, try to recover those uh, monies that were lost, any that you can. Uh, you've got to try, then try to revise uh, uh, criteria relating just to the fact that uh, many of the uh, settlement agents, uh, there wasn't any particular criteria established in how you could become a settlement agent, and there was no bonding required so that if there was a loss, we could uh, uh, file on that bond to recover that loss. Uh, all these things I'm sure that you're thinking of and you're doing and you have a a master plan and how you're going to recover those things and put people in place to monitor those things. And you certainly, I have every confidence, are going to review the reports, the uh, IG reports, and, and <coughs> look for those problem areas that have to be uh, worked on. But, um, oh, incidentally, inside joke, uh, I, pr I agree with probably 99 and 9 tenths percent of uh, your uh, uh, actions since you've been Secretary of State, except one, your uh, recommendation <laughs> for the Jitty May uh, position. <laughs> and I think you, <laughs> you know about that. It never, uh, <laughs> never occurred, Mr. Martinez. But, and I'm grateful for that because we saved the country in embarrassment. Right. But um, the thing is that with all these things that you have to do, well, my question 
uh, is simply, can't we find some way to continue those programs, especially I'm thinking about the, the senior uh, programs, right. you know. It, let me tell you, in my district, we have had each time that one of those projects has been uh, completed, uh, people lining up a night ahead, two days ahead, in sleeping bags and, and camping out to try to get one of those spots. We've also had cities that have been uh, irritated by the fact that they were developed in their city for the benefit of their seniors and find that because of the uh, federal requirements that uh, anybody coming from anywhere, which is right, can apply for those and then a very few people of their own communities being served. With the tremendous need that's there, I can't, I can't really uh, see how we can afford to suspend those things. And I understand that there's also the concern of of monies, and if it would take supplementals, going back to the uh, uh, the uh, fact that uh, the chairman has asked you, would you fight for monies that the, that the department needs to conduct their business? And I'm sure you would, but, and I understand too when you say, and I want to have you uh, correct me if I'm wrong, what you're saying is that you would fight for what's needed with the administration, but once that you had fought the fight and lost, you're a team member, and you've yes. got to play for the best interest of the team. Absolutely. Isn't that right? Absolutely. So what I'm saying is that in this fight, and it might need to take place right away, can we find some way to continue those very important programs? And in answering that question too, I'd like to get a response as to how much turnaround time. Now, I, I know that right. you don't intend to <coughs> suspend these programs right. indefinitely or forever, but that there, there probably is some turnaround time you need to uh, reestablish the way these programs are uh, carried out. Well, let and me we say to the gentleman from California, first of all, I appreciate very much his comments very much as expression of uh, confidence in uh, what we're trying to do. And I take it very seriously, as I told Mr. Lantos earlier, the comments that this committee has made to the secretary about not only what I'm trying to do, but what we are trying to assemble on behalf of the, of the great goals, I call it. Now, having said that, I want to reassure you, as I tried to say in my opening uh, comments, that well, I was not interested in uh, slaughtering programs. This was not a war on uh, uh, the Congress or the intent of the program. I want to wage with you on, in the committee and others a war on poverty. That's why President Bush chose me, didn't choose me to, to, uh, to uh, follow a scorched earth policy at HUD. When mod rehab was canceled, we started it again within two months, Congressman, within two months. I mean, the program will work better today than it was prior to our having the, well, I was going to use uh, a different word, I'll just say audacity, to stop it, suspend it, reopen it, put out a NOFA, allow more public housing authorities uh, to participate, and make sure the program is carefully monitored, audited, and works on behalf of needy people, and we get the greedy out, A. B, uh, when the, the, uh, um, Retirement center, senior retirement center program, uh, which we thought was flawed as it was being currently practiced. We suspended it. We canceled it. Uh, it was not a legislative initi uh, 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 It was not legislatively uh, initiated. Uh, I think it could be better targeted. Let me put it that way. Look, I think resources that you and I have to spend are precious. They're the taxpayer of America's hard-earned money. They ought to go to the, those who are in need. And I want to make sure that the programs are designed correctly and implemented efficiently and are competitive and, <clears throat> and meritorious uh, purpose and uh, are targeted not to upper-income folks. And then. Uh, uh, I canceled Title 10 because it just wasn't, it didn't make any sense. It didn't make any sense. But there's 50, over 50 programs, I think, at HUD. And uh, I'm not interested in uh, doing anything other than making sure our precious resources, over which you and I have a fiduciary responsibility to the hard working men and women of America, uh, we want them to work and to go to the right people and to go to the needy communities and uh, that is my sole purpose and uh, I hope I demonstrate that and when I don't, call me before your committee or, but I'll, I'll, I appreciate so much the words that have been said about 
me, and I don't take it personally. I take it as a sign of, of the goodwill that there is in this country for, the, for, the, for meeting the needs of the, of the people who have been left behind, Mr. Chairman. Personal, uh, Mr. Secretary. Well, I take some of them personally. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, uh, let me just say that uh, when you uh, gave the dissertation, if we can call it that, a while back, I was ready to say uh, Kemp for president. Uh, <laughs> but uh, <Careful>. well, <laughs> one of the things that uh, I'm also concerned one. about, and because I had this experience with the previous secretary, is that, uh, and consultant, is that in uh, <coughs> attempting to provide uh, help to one of my cities in obtaining a UDAG grant, uh, when the proposal was drawn up by consultants, uh, it was badly drawn, uh, drawn late and went past the deadline. Uh, we uh, uh, did uh, get a, an extension of time, which we were grateful for, and that was like pulling my teeth. And then subsequently, uh, we had one of our staffers working with someone from the department, uh, providing very little technical assistance, to redo the grant, really, in where I always felt that the city should have never paid the consultant because they weren't really worth the money that that uh, they uh, obtained, that they were paid to do that grant. And subsequently, the city did get the, the grant. We were very grateful because that's one of those poor cities that because of that economic development is being able to turn itself around a little bit. But it goes back to the heart of what you said about consultants. You know, if, if a lot of these cities uh, who are in need like this and uh, uh, community organizations who are in need could work through their congressman and work through you rather than having to go to the consultant I think it would be a lot better for them in the long run. Could I make a comment? Sure. A lot of people in the press, for the right reason, have asked me over and over and over again, hey, what about a congressman or woman calling you? What is it, you know, what's the difference? And I, I feel like my training in my 18 years in the Congress stands me in pretty good stead. Because I think you should fight for the people of your district. You have an obligation to them. And you also have an obligation to do what is best for the good of the country. And the balance in, in equilibrium is the great challenge of a representative democracy, of which you know we all appreciate. But I want you to be able to call HUD. I don't. People say, well, who called HUD? I think you should call me or call. But I don't want HUD to be run in such a way as you think that you've got to be a Republican or the next, you know, you got to be a Democrat or that you've got to have some uh, political pull. Uh, that is not the way the programs should be uh, run. It's not the way you should allow them to be designed. And as a congressman from California, uh, and, and, or uh, a congresswoman from New Jersey, yeah, she just happened to leave, but uh, Mrs. Rockham, I think we have to be very careful how we design the programs to take out the possibility of directly subsidizing people and, uh, uh, or developers or consultants. I think the subsidy should be for the deserving. <laughs> For the poor, for the communities that need help, and uh, therein lies, I think, what you just said. Uh, the responsibility is to fight for a program and to fight for a community, fight for people, but not to have a program so abused that you got to know somebody. I agree with you, uh, Secretary Kim. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Thank Mr. you very much. Congressman Kyle. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Secretary, you identified uh, I think seven different programs that have already received attention by your department. The Section 8 uh, uh, Mod Rehab Program, the FHA Sales Program, the Insurance Program, the Section 8 Fraud Problem in Denver, Title 10 Program, and the Retirement Service Centers. And then you also talked about the general matter of ethics, which of course pervades uh, all of uh, what we've been talking about. I hate to bring up another bad apple, but uh, as the chairman said, we need to bring these things out and uh, fix responsibility where they are and try to get to the bottom of problems as they exist. Um, the Community Development Block Grant Program has uh, just recently um, come under fire in Camden, New Jersey. Just before the 4th of July, there were a series of newspaper stories, uh, which I've had an opportunity to read, but I haven't had an opportunity yet to follow up on from the New York Times, the Philadelphia Inquirer, and the Camden Courier Post. And according to these newspaper stories, over about a three-year period, there was uh, $1.29 million uh, run through the Greater Camden Development Corporation. And uh, the allegations uh, are to the FBI and to your department, I think, and I'm going to get to this in just a moment, 
that uh, HUD funds were used to purchase drugs, uh, that HUD funds were used to pay for vacations for high-ranking politicians, that HUD funds were siphoned into local political campaigns uh, for the state assembly there, and that when HUD investigators audited the uh, development corporation, they were given a phony set of books, uh, as a result of which uh, most of the abuses were covered up, uh, and they couldn't really get to the bottom of the problem. It's also uh, alleged, I believe, that some 80% of, uh, of the money used, uh, taxpayers' money, was used for overhead, which is a clear violation of the guidelines of the department. Uh, there's also uh, an allegation that the, one of the directors, perhaps the first director of the program, uh, was uh, muscled out of office because he was trying to do it by the book rather than to uh, play politics with the program. Now, obviously, if these things are true, there are criminal violations, uh, it is uh, uh, one of the grossest uh, abuses that we've heard of yet. It's another new program, the CDBG program. And since you didn't uh, mention it in your testimony, I wanted to bring it up now and uh, ask you if you're aware of the uh, pending investigation and specifically what you could tell us about uh, the Inspector General, whether HUD is itself uh, looking into this and uh, I, I think our committee will probably want to get into this after a while, but uh, what, what we might see from HUD in the meantime. Well, let me uh, assure the committee that uh, the Inspector General at HUD is investigating. The FBI is investigating, as the gentleman pointed out. Uh, I would be hard-pressed to go uh, beyond that and make a uh, personal uh, comment uh, because uh, I just don't know enough at this point other than the allegations that have been made in the press as the gentleman alluded to. Uh, if, there, uh, if there were a fraudulent set of books, it would be not only highly irregular but criminal in nature. Uh, HUD, uh, under our aegis, is willing to look at any CDBG monies to make sure that they are spent according to how the taxpayer and the Congress would direct them, i.e. to the uh, needy uh, communities and needy programs of, of those communities. And it's being carefully looked at and it is being monitored, audited, and investigated by both the IG and the FBI. So I would not have much more to say about it at this point. But uh, I want you to know um, we would be willing at HUD to look at any irregularity of any CDBG monies spent. In fact, we have had, uh, as uh, this committee knows, uh, the willingness to look at uh, CDBG monies, community development block grant monies uh, in other parts of the country, in, but including Camden as well. And I appreciate the, uh, the Secretary's comment. The, the story really just broke in the papers, I think, on the 1st of July, so it's, uh, it's not something that's been kicking around for a long time. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm sure that we'll want to discuss this and, and consider getting into it. Uh, this is a program that uh, uh, probably uh, deserves some investigation. Just as, as a matter of edification for uh, all of us, Mr. Chairman, uh, could I conclude by asking the Secretary or, or really anybody else to just tell us very briefly what the process is for an Inspector General investigation? In other words, the Inspector General doesn't work for the Secretary of a government department. Uh, in a sense, uh, he's in one of those dotted line positions off to the side. And I think it's helpful for the public and Good. the media to understand how this process works. We have the Department of Justice and the it's FBI that are question. working in one area. And when the Inspector General gets into something, he's not uh, uh, reporting to the Secretary every day. He's an independent uh, person here. Perhaps we could have a little bit of... Uh, dialogue on this it. is such an easy question to answer and will take such a little time to answer I'm gonna ask Al Delabovi to do it I'll, I'll take the tough ones no it is it's a technical question I'm gonna ask uh, under Secretary Delabovi Mr. Kyle the procedure is that uh, whether for an investigation or an audit the uh, inspector general and his staff will conduct uh, that uh, work uh, if it is an audit uh, it leads to a, uh, a draft report which is presented to the uh, part of the agency that's being audited for comments. Those comments may be incorporated into the uh, report. A final report is then prepared, which is presented uh, to, the, uh, uh, to the agency. On investigations, the procedure is very similar without the comment uh, approach, uh, except that the investigation report is presented to the secretary, uh, and he must act on it. Investigation reports do have a, a, a definite action sheet 
the audit, uh, the normal audit reports, uh, the secretary doesn't have to sign for action when he receives it. It's presented to the program manager, usually an assistant secretary or a regional manager, a regional administrator. And uh, that official's uh, responsibility is to respond, uh, make what we call a management decision. Uh, if no management decision is reached within six months, it goes on the delinquent list. Twice a year, the inspector general uh, reports to the Congress uh, th those uh, on the status of ongoing investigations. Those reports are rather, rather thick at HUD. Uh, and uh, finally, when a management uh, decision is reached, uh, there is then the process of, collect of following up and carrying it out, implementing it. Generally, that means collecting money, uh, and that, too, uh, is monitored and, uh, and tracked and, and needs to be carried out. Failure to carry it out uh, means that the action or inaction will be reported uh, in the IG's next semi-annual report to the Congress. With respect to an investigation such as that that is reported to be occurring uh, in the Camden, New Jersey situation, the uh, IG would actually perform his work, submit a report to the secretary, and if the newspaper wasn't uh, discussing the issue, is it necessarily the case that the secretary would even be aware of it until he received the report? Well, the, I, the uh, Inspector General has a memorandum of uh, understanding with the FBI uh, under which uh, investigations are uh, uh, coordinated. The IG and the FBI uh, work very closely together. In the case of Camden, our IG was in on the uh, serving of the subpoena for the 34 boxes of documents that were discovered uh, two weeks ago. Uh, and uh, uh, it is uh, more than likely that the uh, IG would uh, uh, post the, uh, the officials in the department if he felt it would not compromise uh, the uh, investigation. I think more detailed questions along that nature uh, would probably best be directed to the Inspector General. It is absolutely his call. He is appointed separately by the President, uh, though he does uh, report to the, uh, uh, through the departmental structure. May I uh, add a, uh, sure. a brief comment? Sure. Uh, I, too, can ask for a audit or a investigation, and uh, I have seen articles and newspapers that have touched my uh, touched a responsive chord in my mind and heart and that have prompted me to ask uh, Mr. Adams, ask the IG at HUD to look into and investigate uh, irregularities, alleged irregularities uh, or improprieties. And uh, I, I have been, I think there's been a, a good cooperation uh, and I am, I'm pleased so far with the working relationship uh, that I have had and uh, I know uh, uh, I think it can work. Uh, I think it, the system can work. And I think it particularly works when we have <laughs> uh, committees like this and uh, men and women of goodwill who want to make the system work. Uh, I thank you, Mr. Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> thank you very much. Uh, Congressman Wise. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Secretary, I admire your, your optimism and your positive spirit. Now, if you won't characterize HUD as a swamp, how about a pending wetlands. <laughs> you really want an answer? Uh, no, that's uh, uh, because remember wetlands you can still drain. Um, I have several uh, questions uh, in specific areas and one of them I might as well uh, be deal somewhat with the IG. We have been focusing here basically at what is uncovered nationally and the administration of HUD at a national level. But yet many of us for several years, not knowing what was going on nationally, have been working at the, at the field office level in our state. In my case, of course, the state of West Virginia is one entire field office. <coughs> uh, there has been incredible controversy there uh, uh, surrounding the former director. Uh, it, I mean, I guess it could be routine by what we're learning about has been happening in HUD. We've had two grand jury indictments. Uh, uh, that those trials are pending. We've got uh, one s dismissal or suspension of a HUD field director. We've got uh, 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 an IG's investigation, at least one that we know of and maybe two, and plus a suspension that was then or with a subsequent reinstatement that nobody will talk about. The question I have is, it's two part. One is, what's gonna be, how can we, I know you've got a lot to work on, but how do we guarantee that, that uh, there's attention being given to the HUD field offices. 
And the second one is a specific one, and what I'd like to do before you leave is to leave a letter with you, uh, requesting if, that you review or someone on your staff review uh, to see about releasing information concerning the suspension of the former field director. Uh, he was suspended for alleged uh, conflict of interest and uh, dealing with real estate uh, developers. Uh, he was then reinstated, although HUD said that he, they still had great problems with him, subsequently sent him to Alaska. He didn't take the transfer and, and resign. He says that he can't release any information because HUD won't let him. And yet it seems to me there's a very a public question that needs to be answered here. So I would ask that HUD review and see whether you can release that information. Second is, how, is there going to be a process by which many of us who had questions over the last several years and thought that things were just proceeding as normal, that now that there's going to be information coming forth? Uh, is it going to be more open is what I'm saying. I'm frustrated that the uh, inspector general doesn't seem to respond uh, as to whether or not uh, uh, what he learned. Uh, uh, Secretary Pierce never answered letters. Uh, so it's, it's been a real communication stonewall. Congressman, let me uh, suggest uh, that the best answer to this question would be that I would be very happy to get the people involved in and HUD at the at the level of the headquarters uh, to brief you and your staff on uh, any of the questions that you have or any other member, Mr. Uh, Lantos, uh, any questions that uh, members have about field operations of HUD, uh, I would be happy to get uh, my uh, relevant uh, team members together and brief uh, any member of Congress, including uh, uh, particularly uh, those who have problems with some of the ongoing investigations in their area or their states, such as West Virginia. So I would just invite you, Bob, Mr. Weiss, uh, to, to uh, come down uh, at our mutually convenient time. And, and uh, let's, let me get my uh, uh, under sec Deputy Undersecretary for Field Operations, Ed Gardner, and uh, we'll brief you and answer any of the questions. I'm not Appreciate that. And that, and I glad to will accept your work invitation with and you and the committee uh, and any member of Congress uh, on some of these complex and perplexing human problems. There's a Privacy Act. There's an ongoing investigation. I don't like to mention people's names uh, on camera in which they have no opportunity to respond, and I, um, nor do I want to whitewash anything that's going on. So I'm in a little bit of a dilemma, but I'd be happy to have you down or come up to your office or any other member's office. No, I look forward to that, Thank and I'll you. follow up. Second thing is, we in West Virginia have had problems, and I suspect it may be true in other areas, at least that's what these hearings are bringing out, with the concept of the fair share formula. Now, fair share on its surface sounds great, but what we've seen fair share used for, particularly in a rural area, <coughs> as, for instance, uh, used to deny units or vouchers where there were long waiting lists and we have uh, uh, public housing authorities with hundreds of people lined up. Most uh, dramatic was uh, in the case of the flood in 1985 in which over half of our state was declared a federal disaster area. HUD denied any relief uh, despite hundreds of homeless flood victims. And so it has seemed to me in the past that every time, uh, oh, and the final, the final concern is that it was our understanding, we had been told by the regional HUD office, that we had, had worked the system the best of anyone had in terms of meeting the requirements, lease up, all of those things. Um, and then the, ch the formula was changed next year, and that was the reason we couldn't get the units, even though we'd shown such good performance the year before. Uh, the fair share formula seems to have been quite arbitrarily applied. And I just wonder, first of all, whether what the fair share formula is, because no one's given me a concrete uh, uh, definition of it, and I think it's kind of a floating thing. And second is whether it's something that you will continue to to urge, because as I say, it seems to be uh, uh, applied in a discretionary matter, matter at best. Well, fair sharing does differ, Congressman, from program to program. Uh, I don't know that there's just one definition of fair sharing. The Mod Rehab Program, though, fair sharing was waived uh, for much of the last uh, uh, administration. And it was all left to the discretion of, uh, of, the, of, the, of, of the secretary. And I, that's what I ended. I'm not interested in, in having that type of discretion. I've been told, uh, uh, I mean, I really want to take discretion, i.e. politics, out of these programs 
And so fair sharing the program on, say, mod rehab would differ from fair sharing maybe in a different uh, program such as uh, you alluded to in your question. Um, but I would be glad to, on any uh, uh, of these questions, be glad to respond uh, individually to any member uh, of uh, individual problem such as you experienced in West Virginia. But uh, I can assure you that we want to put an end to the type of discretion uh, that led to some of the problems. And our NOFAs, our uh, Notice of Fund Availability, are going to uh, invite applications in 89 and 90 uh, on a basis that I think would make you far more confident that the programs were predicated on need, not on someone's uh, discretion. I would appreciate that. I greatly <coughs> appreciate that because I just need to know what the rules of the game are. Well, if you're telling we, me, we if, want that too. Yeah, if you're telling me, and I think that's what you are, yes, the secretary, is that it's going to be there are going to be some set rules. Yes, sir. Uh, that's fine. Then we'll play that way. If otherwise it's discretionary, and and what I found in the last three years, somebody was asking the difference <coughs> between a consultant and a congressman. What I was found in the last three years was it would probably have been better for my constituents if they could have just elected a consultant. Uh, because that person knew how to play it, and apparently I didn't, and uh, we because we were playing it by the rules. But I appreciate that. Let me I assure you and every other uh, member that may be listening or watching or here today that uh, uh, I, having been in the Congress for 18 years and having come from an area like Buffalo, New York, I feel like this is one of the major reforms that I can help implement, and I think it would be something that Mr. Lantos would champion as well. Oh, Make I that type of a appreciate your attention. Yes. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, Congressman Shays. Mr. Kemp, I'm one of, of many who have worked on this committee very hard. This committee uh, has amazed me by its attendance because I think we all feel we're doing very important work. And I think we feel that way uh, because of what you're doing and knowing that we're not going to just be pointing out wrongdoing, but we're going to see a change at HUD that ultimately is going to benefit the people that HUD is supposed to serve. So that's why we're all working like we are. Um, I find it ironic in a way that the problems first started out from your involvement with the Inspector General and that the Mod Rehab was the first program that we looked at. Because when we looked at the Mod Rehab uh, report done by the Inspector General, it really, at first glance, you, your, your reaction was, my God, this is unbelievable. But then as you got into it, you, there were so many questions that weren't answered by the IG's report. The, the key players weren't part of it. You know, why was the Secretary Pierce left out? Why was Deborah Gordine, you know, his assistant left out? Uh, Hunter Cushing and others. And I have to then say that I began to really question the value of the Inspector General's report. And one of the, I think, important points that you've made to us today is that there are a lot of reports that you've had the opportunity to look at that you're saying we should look at as well. Um, I guess the, the question I want to ask is, If this is a problem that has existed for 20 years, and it is a problem that's existed for 20 years, why has it existed there for so long? Um, and I guess I I'm, I'm con con can conclude that you know we all share in the blame. The IG could have been more aggressive. It's not, it's, you got to not just uncover the wrongdoing, but you got to make sure people act on it. Congress should have done a better job of its oversight. Clearly, the past administration should have appointed better people. We should have had managers who wanted to make a difference. Yeah, right. But the bottom line to all this is, why for 20 years? Well, Congressman, uh, I wasn't, when I talked about 20 years, I, but I you're hope right. you took the it in the spirit that right. I meant that some of the problems have existed over longer than just eight years. So uh, it is not the purpose we, of the we secretary. Did, we did get that point, Mr. Yeah, right. Uh, I, I hope the committee knows that uh, the secretary is not, uh, that I am not trying to cast off uh, blame on uh, any one party or any one person. I think there are, there is room. And I think the chairman made a very, very 
uh, important point a number of days ago when on television asked a question. He said, both political parties have to let the chips fall where they may. There are, he didn't say this, I have said it, Tammany Hall Democrats and maybe some Tammany Hall Republicans were finding out, but irrespective of that, my statement about 20 years was not to shift the blame. It was simply to recognize that there were some systemic flaws and poison in the system, but Mont Rehab did not was not flawed for 20 years. It recently was under investigation because of a criminal investigation about a tie-in between a charity and HUD. Now, again, I, it, that led to certain things. No, but I, it was a criminal investigation which led to another investigation which led to another allegation. And of course, uh, we're letting the chips fall where they may. And you and the chairman have been quite vigorous in asking questions of the IG on your own. I simply responded to the feeling that I have that he has been forthright with me, that he has uh, reported to me things that he has found uh, as quickly as he's found them. I have taken action on those, and the management techniques that I am implementing with the help of my team at HUD are a lot different than occurred in the last eight years, if you want me to say it, as well as the last 20 years. So I guess I'm trying to make I didn't want to give the impression that I thought mod rehab uh, uh, no, you didn't give that impression. These problems existed for 20 years, and why didn't they get uh, cleared up earlier? You didn't give that impression. Okay. All right. I'm sorry. Yeah. I, no, read the, more I guess into your the question point I'm trying have. to make to you is that I have been a critic of the IG's office because, in one area, I've had tremendous problems. I think your point to us is that you know we should take a closer look. There have been many studies he's done that he's done very well, and if we had acted on those studies, maybe we wouldn't be where we are today. That's still, in my opinion, and I think that's very important. And the IG has had an incredibly long and distinguished career, which should, should be noted. I guess the point I'm trying to make to you is the IG's office becomes a useless office if uh, we don't act upon it. And the whole point I'm making is if HUD is, as I think it is in some cases, a swamp that needs to be drained and cleaned up and the good people need to be pushed forward, if that's the case, What's the point of an IG's office, though, that has existed there for so long? So what do we need to do that will make that difference? Now, when we get these reports that are given to us, and, and, and Mr. Kemp, these are the reports that we're given every six months. If you look at the reports, they're so general in nature. They, they, they basically say things while, like just talking about coinsurance. While HUD has taken aggressive action to improve its monitoring of coinsurance lenders' performance, more effective controls and enforcement efforts are needed, and so on. Now, it, what it basically does is say, we got this and we got this. Now, what you've made me wonder is, if maybe this committee should be, though we know there's Did you want to make a comment, Mr. Delaboli? No, we were just, uh, uh, we listened to your uh, question. I listened to your question quite, uh, it's, it's, it's a thoughtful question. Um, there, is there subjectivity in the process? The answer to that is yes. Is there human judgment in that report? The answer to that is yes. And no one would say that quicker than Mr. Adams himself. But look, each of the recommendations in that red book that you have points to a specific recommendation and a specific problem. And there is backup evidence. And the system is only as good as you and I make it. And I. I, uh, all I'm suggesting is I don't think it's uh, quite fair to suggest that that represents the total amount of flagging that the IG did. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of work that went into that report that you could point up that, 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 that has been laying on desks, uh, plural, uh, for some time. And, and I'm not, you know, I, I'm, I'm, in a, I'm in a position where I want to make sure that we respond both to objective as well as subjective uh, analyses. And I will admit to you that there was not a as good enough job done in the past of where the fault lies. I would expect it will come out in this wonderful process we call uh, the democratic uh, system. But uh, I, I guess this uh, is as far as I'm concerned, speaking for myself and my team, we are working with our IG. The AG, the attorney general is working with them. The FBI is working with them. And I think we can make the system work with the spirit that I see in the room and the goodwill among men and women in both political parties. So We can uh, make the system work. We need you. We need the committee. We need the IG. And I agree with that. 
I guess the point I'm trying to, to ask you is, I guess the point I'm trying to ask you is, if you weren't listening to the IG, <clears throat> it seems to me nothing would happen. And what that introduces to me is this whole question of an arm's length uh, distance between the IG and the people he's supposed to look at. He's only as successful as the people in the department let him be. And that seems to me to be a fundamental flaw with an IG. And in, in, forget this IG, with the, with the system. And I guess I'm trying to find something that would, what happens if you just decided not to, to look at all that he's done? I don't think it would happen. Well, you're, uh, you're, you're asking a very thoughtful question, and it's a profound one. It goes to the heart of how we make the whole system work. We have a free press. We have an investigative uh, uh, climate. We have uh, crusading. I don't mean that to be pejorative, but we have men and women in the Congress. Some take a greater interest in these issues than other people. <clears throat> Why, I can't exactly explain, but I think uh, somehow or other uh, it comes to the surface. Uh, and uh, uh, if I weren't there, what would happen? I think that there'd be uh, someone uh, as good or better uh, to do the job. Did it happen in the last eight years? Apparently not, and, and much to the discredit of the previous uh, administration, to be flat out brutal about it. But that's the judgment that the public will make. Now, does that stain the whole uh, presidency of Mr. Reagan? I don't think it does. He has to be measured against other things. So I guess what I'm saying to the gentleman from Connecticut who I know has done uh, admirable and, and uh, yeoman work in this committee with the chair, uh, that it, what you're saying is true, and I think what I'm saying is, is partially true, and I think what the IG is saying is partially true, and can we have a perfect system? No, but does it work in cumbersome fashion and, and agonizingly slow at times? The answer to that is, I think, demonstrably yes today. I, I so uh, I don't think you could have a, I don't think you and I could pass legislation that would make it uh, work uh, any uh, in any any better. I think uh, the reforms that are coming out are going to be helpful, and I think Mr. Darman has now asked every agency of the Bush administration to probably undertake uh, some scrutiny with regard to their own IGs that. And that's a good thing. So I, I think the gentleman has made a lot of progress. I hope he doesn't get frustrated by uh, the system because I, I, think I don't it get is frustrated at all. I love and, system. And, uh, I, with the gentleman yield on that point? Yes, they would. You know, we get these reports every six months, as you do get every six months. It would seem to me that it's incumbent on either the secretary or the Congress to act. If the secretary didn't act in the past on those, neither did the Congress. And so that, you know, when you start painting, pointing fingers and that, and saying who's to blame, we're all to blame. Well, I think what has happened here, though, we've got a secretary that will read the reports, and I would imagine, it, it just is my own opinion, that if I read that recommendation that was made criticizing some aspect of my operation, that I would say, what do you mean by this? Explain this to me if it seems ambiguous in there, and it really doesn't seem that ambiguous to me. But I would say that you would be challenging, and he would say, well, this is why, and it would be up to you to prove that he's wrong if you could. That being the fact that you didn't act in that manner, then it would be incumbent, I think, on the Congress or the committee to take that responsibility to say, hey, what do you mean by this, and let's look farther, and then call you before us to say, why, why are you not reviewing this, and why are you not doing it? But what I'm saying, I guess, it's incumbent on each of us who have that yes, responsibility not to negate that responsibility by just ignoring it. No, I, absolutely. But I, I, I think I... I think I hear what the gentleman from California, as well as the gentleman from, from Connecticut, is saying that Congress also has a responsibility. And uh, I think this IG and all the IGs would respond to a call from uh, a committee. I know they do. I know they do. I know flat out that they do. And I think we ought to give the American people uh, the uh, full, uh, the, 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 the clear perception that if Lantos or Conyers or Shays or Martinez or anybody uh, has uh, uh, a question of an IG, there would be a, resp a positive response. And uh, I, I just, I'm going to keep maybe I'm for two more minutes, and then I'm going to. Um, obviously, Mr. Morrison has some questions. It strikes me 
that I've learned something I didn't know before as I thought about it. You really sat down with the IG in the very beginning and you said, tell me all the good news and the bad news. You learned a lot of bad news. <laughs> right. To say, uh, we started this whole process with the mod rehab. The more we looked into it, the more unbelievable it got to the point where we said, my God, we not only have problems in mod rehab, we've got problems here. And then finally got to the point, if someone said, do we have a problem in this unit within HUD? I said, you know, we probably do. And you know what? We, we did. Now, Darman, um, had Director Darman has responded in the sense to what you've done. And it seems to me he's saying to everyone else and all these other departments, I want you to do just what Jack Kemp did, because we have an inspector general here who did this. We may have the same problem in other groups. In effect, yes. Now, it says to me that there has to be some fatal flaw with this system. And it strikes me that the system to date is only as good as the cabinet official allows it to be. And that we've got, we have a system, for instance, under law that says that when, when you know that there's a serious problem, you as, as the cabinet official have to talk to Congress directly and flag it. And it strikes me that we need a system that says when the inspector general talks to you or anyone else and he doesn't feel he's getting the response, that he literally has to present in person to the President of the United States or to one of his office people or to Congress that we've got these problems and dump the particular audit on our desk. Not give us a list and say, I've done this, but just say, here, Mr. Lantos, here is mod rehab. We're not getting a response from the department. And it seems to me that, that that's what's required. And it may be a yeah. law. It may not be. I'm just responding to what you have talked yeah, about, and, and uh, that's basically my No, I, I appreciate uh, the sincerity with which the question is asked and the profound uh, question of the age uh, uh, surrounding this uh, problem of, of, a, of a democratic form of government. I, I don't want the IG to have veto power over a program. I don't think you're suggesting that. Uh, you want him to flag it to the secretary and to the Congress uh, frankly, some of these things have, as I think the chairman has uh, uh, alluded to uh, earlier, uh, has been laid before the Congress. I think, and I told him that I want him, and I think Mr. Darman has said, predicated upon our model, we want you to scream and holler, uh, excuse the expression, but uh, uh, we want them to uh, feel confident about the relationship they have with the secretary, the administration, and the Congress. And maybe some good will come out of this. And I don't think, Chris, it is a fatal flaw. That's where I disagree with you. I don't think it's a fatal flaw. I don't think it's a swamp. I think it is recoverable, manageable. I think we can make these programs work. And I think it came at a propitious time because we were all getting too lax about programs that were passed on behalf of poor people existing in perpetuity because they had, quote unquote, a noble goal. And, and I'm not criticizing anybody. This is not a diatribe from the right against the left or vice versa. It is a recognition that all too often we have neglected to take a, a, uh, a willingness to look at these programs with the type of scrutiny that I applaud this committee for giving to HUD. And the good that come, can come out of this can be applicable across the board to defense, to HHS. Uh, and I think it's going to help Republican administration. But I also think it's going to someday help, uh, you know, maybe someday there will be a Democratic administration again. I don't, I don't know. Who knows? Uh, stranger things have happened. Hope, uh, hope springs it's getting eternal. Late in the day, hope springs You've got to be eternal. careful of uh, me after. Uh... No, I, I, I don't want to treat this. This is not a trivial uh, question, and I don't treat it triv with triviality, Mr. We understand Chairman. You. Mr. Shays has a very serious point, and I, I hope yeah. I have responded. Uh, Before I call on, on my next colleague, may I just uh, echo what you said, Mr. Secretary. Uh, Congressman Shays has done yeoman's work on this committee, uh, not only in terms of the quantity and quality of his contributions, but in, in attempting to keep uh, this whole investigation as fully bipartisan as it has been. And the chair wants to publicly express his appreciation to the gentleman from Connecticut. Uh, Congressman Morrison. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first, I'd just like to comment that uh, among the many good things that Secretary Kemp has said in his testimony today, 
uh, has been his reference to the, uh, to the HUD employee staff in general, which has uh, uh, not been the source of most of the problems that we're talking about here, and in fact has uh, discharged its responsibilities in a responsible fashion. And uh, it's something that we could easily lose sight in, in, uh, in talking about some of the abuses by outside consultants, outside contractors, and political appointees at the top. I think that the professional staff at HUD must feel demoralized by, the, by constantly reading about their agency on the front page of the Post and the Times, et cetera, in negative terms. And uh, I think the Secretary has been importantly forthright in pointing out uh, the quality of those people and the need to, to let them do their job in a professional fashion. I, I think, I think that you, I they think should be know. grateful for, for that kind One of... One correction. They're not demoralized any longer. Okay. They good. really aren't. They got a good coach. Not, no, not, not, I'm not taking the credit right. for it, but I think there's a sense that uh, uh, there is something big going on at HUD, and I think there's a good feeling both vertically and horizontally uh, throughout HUD that uh, we really care about people and, and uh, want to make these programs work to the extent possible. Well, I appreciate that. And uh, my first question is, uh, speaking specifically about the mod rehab situation, uh, it's been clear to me as I've heard testimony on this over, over a long period of time, both in this subcommittee and in the housing subcommittee, uh, that there are serious questions of not just improper or unwise conduct, but criminal conduct uh, by representations by developers that they had commitments from HUD for units that would be made available if uh, local housing authorities would submit certain pieces of paper. And either those developers were engaged in fraudulent conduct in getting an inside deal working at the local level, or they were engaged in some form of conspiracy with HUD to go around the rules, which even despite all the waivers of the rules, have said from beginning to end that the, the mod rehab money was supposed to go to housing authorities and not to developers. And I heard uh, the secretary uh, in, in an interview program a couple of weeks ago comment on this uh, and suggest that he thought there was criminality here. And I, I wonder if you could inform us at all about contacts you may have had with the attorney general or with the public integrity section, not on the embezzlement problems, but on the questions of fraud and conspiracy as it relates to the, to, to the Mod Section 8 scandal. When I, uh, when I uh, said that there was criminality involved, I was suggesting that it was in the field of uh, property disposition among uh, escrow agents uh, in the field. Uh, I did not specifically suggest, because uh, I had no reason to suggest that there was criminality in the mod rehab uh, program. I want to say to my uh, friend from uh, Connecticut, uh, there was a very thorough uh, investigation. It's an ongoing investigation. The, uh, the, uh, attor the Attorney General has uh, cooperated fully in looking into the operations uh, at the field office level at our request, by the way. Uh, but the Inspector General so far and the uh, Attorney General so far have said that in their opinion there is yet to show up any uh, criminal allegations. Uh, I would assume, although I don't know for sure, I would assume that those, that, that uh, investigation is ongoing and if there is it'll show up. But if there's not, I think we ought not to, uh, not with, notwithstanding some of the unseemly nature of uh, how the programs were abused, I don't think we should stain uh, uh, the reputations of, of uh, people with the, the allegations of criminality in the mod rehab program. I don't know of anything that would make me Well, make let me just say right that I, it, it's my opinion that when, when you go to a public housing authority and you say, I have a commitment from, the, from a federal agency to provide funds for my development, and if you will apply for these funds, uh, and give them to me, this will all work out. If you don't have that information, that that's fraud. And whether it's criminal fraud may depend on certain particulars of the situation, but I do think it's fraud. And if that's not true, if they didn't have those uh, commitments, that's the fraud side. If they did have those commitments, that was a clear violation of the rules 
and they had to have that in some conspiratorial fashion with people within HUD, because only people within HUD could make those commitments. I think that's a question for the Attorney General, ultimately, not for yourself. I just would hope you would not dismiss that possibility, because well, I think, okay. I think it, that is the stuff of white-collar crime. We're not talking here just about the fact that the, that the uh, consultants got this money, but that there was some scheme going on. And I can tell you from personal experience that a developer came to New Haven, Connecticut, and tried very hard to sell his deal uh, by just those kind of, that kind of conduct. And whether, um, I think there's something more there than just um, overreaching. And well, I there, would hope. There, there very well may be. But you, uh, uh, I am not at this time informed as to uh, uh, any of the allegations uh, that might be made of criminal conduct. And I would treat this question uh, Mr. Morrison, the same as I would treat the question about the investigation into Camden, New Jersey, or some other area. Uh, I have, we've got to trust that the uh, Attorney General and the U.S. Attorneys and the FBI and our IG are going to be able to ferret out uh, any uh, of uh, the criminality of any of these programs. And I can assure you that we'll let the chips fall where they may. But at the other hand, I don't want to carelessly uh, put certain people under a cloud of possible criminal conduct uh, if the IG and the U.S. Uh, I'm sorry, the Attorney General have at this point suggested that there was none involved. Unseemly, yes, uh, as I have said many times. But will I keep my mind open? My mind is open to the possibility the, um, yes. Uh, another thing about the Mod Section 8 scandal that scandalized me uh, was the role that the general counsel played in allowing it to come to pass. Uh, Mr. Knapp testified before this subcommittee about a somewhat elusive oral opinion about the effect of congressional action on the fair share formula, uh, the end result of which was to leave the impression within HUD, apparently, that not only was the fair share formula waived, but a whole host of other regulations were waived, too. Uh, and frankly, Mr. Knapp seems unable to remember exactly to whom and what he said. Now, I'm not going to ask you about Mr. Knapp, but I want to ask you, I, I want to ask you about uh, what instructions you have given to your uh, general counsel designate about the use of the Administrative Procedure Act as a method for suspending or withdrawing or changing regulations. Because what we had in Mod Section 8 was, a, was the oral suspension of public regulations without notice or comment or, in fact, going through the legal procedures. And one of the ways that we get into this kind of trouble is we don't follow the rules that we already have. And I would wonder yeah. if your if you would comment on that, and if you'd also tell us about what kind of instructions well, let me, you've Let given. me tell you who I picked for uh, my uh, general counsel designate, uh, Frank Keating, a former U.S. attorney, uh, worked at the Treasury uh, as an enforcer. He's a, uh, he's a <laughs> as tough as I am on uh, showing absolutely zero tolerance for any of the abuses that have shown up in this and other programs. We've got outstanding men and women throughout our general counsel division, and uh, they are instructed from the top down, and I mean from President Bush right down, uh, that uh, these programs have to be radically and dramatically altered to take out influence and take out the perception as well as the reality of political influence. And that is why we suspended and then reopened and fair shared and took out the discretion from the uh, Mod Rehab program. So Keating uh, and Britt and Albright and uh, the men and women in our uh, division of, 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 of counsel are going to be uh, uh, at my right arm, uh, right hand, uh, in cleaning it up and cleaning it out and making it work. Uh, I can assure you that. Well, I, th I think that the way in which the Mod Rehab reform was implemented, certainly is consistent with the concern that I have. Thank but you. I just should emphasize that right. we're talking not just about the substance, we're talking about the process, because it's through the procedural 
mechanisms of using the APA, of using the Federal Register, of not canceling rules secretly uh, or by oral opinion, that we avoid some of these problems because we work around here on the ability to know what's going on. And right. the mod rehab scandal is about some people knowing what's going on and others not. Well, you have my assurance that we will document every single step we've taken. That's why I uh, That's why you have, to, yes, you, you, we, we you have you done so. I want I, you to know. Right. Uh, as an old member of this body and a, and a great respecter of the House of Representatives, uh, I want every member of Congress on both sides of the aisle to feel good about what uh, President Bush has charged us with doing at HUD. So you have my assurance that it will all be in, in uh, black and white. My final question goes to this. Um, we've heard some testimony on the co-insurance program, and I assume that there may be more uh, looking into that. Uh, I was somewhat shocked to learn that some 70 percent of the, the insured lending being done at HUD was being done on the coinsurance basis, whereas prior to the Reagan administration, uh, almost all, if not all, of insured lending was done uh, with 100 percent risk by the government, but also 100 percent underwriting uh, checks by, uh, by government uh, officials who had no temptation whatsoever uh, to find a scheme. And apparently some people seem to have found a scheme under coinsurance, despite their taking a nominal risk to make money by inflating appraisals and, uh, and other such things. And I wonder what the status of your examination of, the co of coinsurance generally is. Is this being re-examined as to whether we ought to be having a coinsurance program at all, for instance? It is being re-examined uh, with a very uh, close scrutiny by uh, our whole housing division, including uh, Mr. Delavobi and, and uh, Austin Fitz, the designee, uh, the designate for uh, housing commissioner. Uh, we have no uh, um, desire to uh, undertake this review with an eye towards uh, either blanket endorsement or blanket rejection. We want it to work. We think it has a role to play in this uh, important, uh, it can be an important tool. And uh, I have told uh, Austin Fitz that I wanted her uh, as the first uh, uh, housing commissioner uh, uh, that I've ever had uh, the opportunity <coughs> to choose, to give this the closest attention of uh, not only uh, her shop, but uh, uh, HUD uh, uh, across the board. So it'll be looked at with that type of scrutiny and open mind and, and an open eye, and, and we have no ideological uh, act to grind. Is there a is there a time frame when you expect to be making it's recommend ongoing, uh, recommendations about the status and the use of coinsurance in the future? We the study period uh, that we have undertaken since we uh, came to HUD will be concluded by the end of the summer, and I would be very happy, I would say to the gentleman, and to this committee. To uh, hopefully uh, Austin Fitz will be confirmed by then. I mean, who knows uh, the way things uh, are going? But uh, little uh, sarcasm there. But uh, it's not your fault, as uh, you pointed out earlier. But uh, we really do need uh, Austin Fitz to be confirmed. Can you imagine trying to do what we're doing at this point in history with one single confirmed uh, Under Secretary of HUD? And I think they've done a magnificent job. And I appreciate the comments you made about the many good men and women who were there, as I did earlier. But uh, uh, I hope she's confirmed by September. And, uh, but we will be back up here, and I'll bring her and let her sit here. And, uh, uh, well, I would will. just urge that there be a thoroughgoing well, review. You bet. Co there will be. And, I, I'm pleased and to we'll be that. glad to discuss it and with we'll this committee and any other committee, Mr. Chairman. And thank I thank you, you for the uh, thank you. opportunity. Thank you very much, Congressman Weiss. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. As a secretary, let me add my words of welcome and commendation to you, along with the other members of the, of the subcommittee. Uh, you're, you've been around here long enough to know that it is very rare when we have a secretary not be defensive about problems <laughs> within his jurisdiction, but in fact to say, I'm going to make sure that it doesn't happen again. I'm going to clean house. And, uh, I think you really deserve the commendation of Congress, the administration, the American people for taking that kind of attitude. Appreciate it. 
let me ask you, I, I note in your prepared testimony at page five <clears throat> that you use some statistics uh, that I would like to have some amplification on. Uh, you say that in this decade, we've increased the number of poor families that we help by more than one third and outlays for assisted, ha assisted housing have increased 162% since 1980. Now, I know, as you do, that the yes, overall budget of uh, your department has gone down from about $31 billion a year to about $9 billion. And so within that context, could you clarify how you got those numbers that, that well, you cite in your testimony? Uh, I was talking, uh, uh, Mr. Weiss, uh, about uh, the anomaly of watching budget authority go down in the 80s while outlays for assisting the tenant directly have gone up. And I was simply trying to put in perspective, not trying to gloss over any charge that might be made, but trying to put in perspective some of the charges that nothing was done, notwithstanding the, the uh, arguments and the disagreements that have occurred over the past eight years, nothing could have been done without Congress. Uh, BA went down, outlays went up, and the outlays for assisting uh, the tenants directly through vouchers and Section 8 certificates went from $6 billion in 1981 to 15 point something billion in 1989. Now again, I'm not making a, uh, uh, a judgment other than to say that there are more people being served directly. And you can make a judgment politically about vouchers. I happen to think they can be a useful tool in empowering people and giving them choice. I have said, and I don't know if you were here or not, that I didn't expect to be the Secretary of Vouchers. I wanted to be the Secretary of Housing and Urban Development. I want to be the Secretary who de helps design programs that will increase opportunity for people to have affordable housing, home ownership, first-time home buyers, uh, tenant management. Uh, but I think vouchers can play a very important role in making sure that the subsidy goes directly into the hands of low-income people, not into the pockets of rich developers. Well, I, I appreciate that, but I would also welcome your submitting to the chairman for the subcommittee's record a breakdown of what the total budgetary outlays, never mind authorization, budgetary okay. outlays were as of 1980 and how those uh, proceeded to change over the course of the time frame from 1980 to 1989 on a program by program basis because that way you can have some idea of exactly what it is that happened. In this I will do my very best but, to do that and I think it would be useful but I want to assure the gentleman from New York as I assured Mr. Schumer the day I called him when I was uh, nominated and pledged to work with uh, all of my friends in the Democratic Party as well as my friends in the Republican Party that I, Jack Kemp, was interested not in, uh, in uh, uh, waging war on on, on the Congress or on the mayors, as all too often had happened in the, in, in, in the past, that I wanted to wage an all-out assault on the conditions of poverty and homelessness and helplessness and despair that I saw in inner city America, and I would be willing as a secretary to entertain the possibility that some programs could be changed, some are working, some weren't working, and that we had to have the, the uh, tenacity and the audacity to, to uh, move forward so uh, I'll do it, but I also would like to sub resubmit my own budget and suggest that uh, we look forward rather than just look backward. But we well, can't go forward without knowing where we've been, so well, I will well, be glad I, listen, to respond it, it, to the It's question. that kind of statement that you just yeah. made that gives me uh, assurance and reassurance about yeah. where you want to go. At the same time, as you've gathered by some of the questions previously, yeah. Uh, there, there are parts of what you've said which make some of us a little bit nervous, and, and well, it has to do get, with, with the Don't get too nervous. Uh, I went on to say that uh, there has been some progress in some programs designed to empower people directly rather than to empower developers and consultants. Not enough was done, and I went on to say, if you look on page five, we have to do a better job of providing meaningful housing opportunities or alternatives for the American people. Now, that is an honest, uh, uh, that's an honest statement. And it stands on its own. And uh, I, I think some perspective, Mr. Uh, uh, Weiss, has to be given to 
to the problems as well as the possibilities of I, I, and that I spirit appreciate that I did that, it. And, and I'm not prejudging. I'm just expressing a note of concern. And uh, I'm hopeful that when, in fact, it is time to judge, we, we find that, that all of our concerns were uh, misplaced. But the fact is that, as you've, you've noted, uh, vouchers don't provide additional housing. You're interested in providing additional housing. You can have all the vouchers in the world. If you've got a tremendous housing shortage, ain't going to help very much. Uh, I must say, in that context also, some of the earlier suggestions for selling off public housing to private ownership, you might call that empowerment, uh, or some, some might. I might call it a denuding of the very limited number of, of public housing that's available at this point for poor people in this country. So those yeah. are the concerns that I have. Uh, the other, in, within that context, I Let me ask you a question. Yes. Uh, let's get yourself yeah. and uh, the chairman and uh, Mr. Schumer and Mr. Shays and a couple of, let's get Fauntroy and Kemp and let's go out and visit Kimmy Gray at Kenilworth Parkside and let's take a look at the Fauntroy Kemp legislation of 1988 which requires that there be a full replacement of all public housing that is managed and owned and ult uh, homesteaded and ultimately owned. I am not interested in denuding anything. I'm not interested in shrinking the stock of anything. I am interested in giving people a chance to manage and control their own lives where, where possible. And I'll tell you what, the most exciting thing, Ted, happening in many parts of our country are those residents of public housing who for the first time in their lives have somebody who believes that they too have uh, the authority and the dignity and uh, some power over the decisions that are made on their behalf. But I assure you, as I told Walter Fontenoy when he first joined in my effort to uh, uh, support urban homesteading, that we would replace uh, one way or another on a one-for-one -one basis those, uh, that public housing that might be the, the, homesteaded. Say, and I want to, say I want what to make that it known assumes, for the record. Mr. It has Secretary, to be known for the record. If you will, what that We're not selling it to Donald. That, what that assumes is that we have enough housing right now and that you can just do a one-for-one -one trade off. And the fact is that there's a tremendous housing shortage. It seems we have to do more than just replace on a one-for-one -one basis. Well, be, beyond that, though, Ted, you must know, and for the record, it has to be known, that Kenilworth Parkside, when it is uh, in two years uh, controlled and, and owned by a cooperative, uh, the Tenant Management Corporation that has been called, they will are required under the law to keep that stock for low-income folk. I don't think that Fauntroy and Kemp could have gotten together had it not been for the requirement that we do it in a way in which we met the needs of low-income people, but also built some dignity into the public housing problems. And I'll tell you what, it was a lot better than blowing up Pruitt Igo, Mr. Chairman. Uh, when I was at Cabrini Green and those women are- I hope those aren't the only alternatives no, that but, we face. Well, and we, Ted, some people think it is. Yeah, yeah. And I don't want to be the secretary that d destroys public housing. I want to be a secretary who cleans it up, cleans it out, and gives people some dignity and a chance to manage and control and, and, and become entrepreneurial, to use a phrase that is... Uh, uh, I, I have no question about your sincerity and your, and your right. commitment. But we've been hearing testimony over the course of these past weeks from gentlemen who in their private prior guises within the administration or within the Republican Party opposed every public governmental program that ever existed uh, and then came in and justified the influence peddling that they engaged in by pointing to the approvals that they had gotten and said, you ought to see those public housing units and how, and, and, or, those, or those mod rehab units and see how pleased those people are and what wonderful conditions they're living under. And I, James Watt, did that. Well, James Watt didn't do that at all. And so it's within that context that we have this, this nervousness or the sensitivity, and I'm, I'm pleased to get your reassurance. <laughs> yes, thank that, you very that's much. That's the record sure. note that the secretary is nodding his approval. Yes, <laughs> Thank you. Congressman Schumer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, Mr. Secretary. It's been a long day. I'm sorry I couldn't be here the whole time. We have a banking uh, markup. But uh, I must say, what's been going on here is more interesting than what's been going on there <laughs> now. Um, for now, anyway. Uh, I have a couple of questions. The first one relates to the total cost. We don't know the total cost of all this mismanagement, waste, fraud, and abuse. Uh, but I've done some thumbnail estimates here, 
Um, I was just wondering uh, what your view would be. My view at maximum, I have minimums and maximums here, but I'll read you the maximums because somehow these numbers turn to grow. Mod rehab, 750 million. Property sales, 50 million. Co-insurance, 650 million. Title 10 mortgage insurance, 250 million. FHA mortgage fraud, 100 million. Retirement service centers, 200 million. Embezzlement in the Denver office, a million. That ends up being approximately about 1.8 about approximately, well, I'll add it up, eight. While you respond, I'll add it up. It's eight and nine. It's 200. It's two billion dollars and one million, whatever, spare change. Have you, I'm sure you've begun to think about this. What are your estimates at this point in time for the total cost of the, uh, of the mismanagement, waste, fraud, abuse, et cetera? And where would my numbers well, be wrong? Uh, uh, you can see the uh, consultations, yeah. gnashing of the teeth, uh, uh, not in the sense of, uh, of uh, trying to, to uh, keep anything from the committee. I think the jury is out on how much it'll cost. I think the jury is out on, uh, on how our asset recovery uh, teams that we've set up can recover some uh, mm -hmm. lost monies rather than engage in how many angels dance on the head of this uh, scandalous pin, uh, I would rather... Many angels. Uh, Maybe there are no devils. angels dancing on the head of the pin, I admit. Right. Uh, but it's, just, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, not the equivalent of that debate by any stretch of the imagination. Right. It's a proper question to ask on behalf of the hardworking, tax-paying uh, American public. Uh, I would leave it on the record uh, what the gentleman says, and I would uh, ask for more time to okay. get a better feel for what the costs uh, are, but I'll tell you this, uh, Charlie Schumer, um, we, I pledge to you, as I pledge to uh, Chairman Lentos, that uh, the changes that we are making and the reforms that uh, we want to make at HUD will ultimately be of benefit to those folks that we represent, and I, I just pledge to you, despite the gruesome statistic, uh, uh, it needs to be kept in, in, in some perspective, and my feeling is to you that we have stopped the hemorrhaging, uh, that it can be managed, that I don't want to leave this hearing room with an impression that I unfortunately gave a number of weeks ago that it was uh, hopeless uh, and that I was helpless. I don't feel helpless. I don't feel hopeless. I don't feel besieged. I feel very good about the type of people that I've got. Uh, with me and uh, around oh, me I, and working on this and I feel good about this committee's uh, investigation and I can tell you sir that I think ultimately we're going to save the taxpayers of America a lot of money while helping poor folk. Well I, I so that's my pleasure. and I think you can hear by, by, uh, by the uh, comments that many people have made today that that fact is shared. I'm just asking you is a two billion dollar figure out of line? Um, I think it's rather conservative. Uh, myself, and I've heard okay. some of the people in HUD estimated as high as six billion dollars in off-the-record basis. No, no, it wouldn't no. be that high. No, I, I don't think it is. But look, you're, you're, the question is is uh, uh, the type of a question that is uh, you uh, uh, obviously know will uh, lead on the uh, six o'clock news, and I uh, I compliment you on the uh, on the ability to ask such a question. Because I've been here for four hours, and uh, you'll probably be the lead story tonight. Uh, but uh, uh, money's so. uh, any money is too much. I think it is you a know, ballpark. Mr. It is our it's a ballpark figure. It's a ballpark figure. It is I a think ballpark. six billion is way too much. Right. Uh, I think a billion would be too low. Okay. But my pledge is that it, uh, we no stop the hemorrhaging, and we're going to okay. turn it around and save uh, the, the the programs so they help poor people and, and taxpayers as well. Okay. Thank Second you. question. Uh, you mentioned before that you might want to reinstate the MOD rehab program, or you were intending to reinstate it after it was cleaned up. As I think that's true. I was we did. not in the room. Yeah, we did. What about some of the other programs that have been suspended? And let me preface it by saying, uh, Mr. Secretary, as somebody who's fought for a lot of housing programs, as you know, over the eight years, uh, I believe you're right. I believe we don't have a kind of programs that were put up in the 60s and 70s and that I have generally supported are hardly a monopoly on truth. 
And if there's a better way to do it, and a better way to help the people in our cities and inner areas, Good. I'm willing to give it a go and meet Good. halfway. Uh, and I respect and appreciate your view that uh, um, that new programs may well be needed. One of the things that's been so frustrating to those of us who've tilled these vineyards are every time some of the people in the previous administration criticized the old programs, we tried to make new programs, as you did with the uh, Fort Roy bill uh, and others, to, re to meet some of those criticisms. Right. And then they'd come down and say to us, no new programs, right. and you're caught in a box. The old ones stink, but no new programs. One can only conclude from that that the people didn't want any housing programs at all, sort of. And you're not saying that at all, and that's, I no, think, by your fresh breeze. My specific question is, what, just uh, again, uh, you've been day to day on top of this more than anybody else could be. <clears throat> what about some of the other programs? Which of them do you think will have to go? Uh, could the co-insurance program survive under any uh, situation? The no. um, the Title X mortgage insurance one. Uh, what is your view as to whether some of these other programs should be? I, uh, I appreciate continue. the question, and it's a good one. And it's been asked several times today. But uh, um, knowing your interest and knowing the discussions that you and I have had on an ongoing right. basis uh, uh, and the strong support you gave uh, to me when I came to you a number of months ago uh, in looking for your support for my nomination, uh, I told you then that I'd, I wasn't out to uh, right. you know, wage a war on uh, you or the Congress. I wanted to wage a war on right. poverty. So from that standpoint, I appreciate the good spirit, the goodwill. Uh, Mod Rehab was reopened. It took two months to redesign it, refocus it, uh, put out the NOFA. We did it on June 9th. I wanted to do it on June 1st, and we, it took us another week, but it was done. I feel fairly certain that we've got it on the right track. I'm willing to look at it on an ongoing basis, and we're going to make sure the IG continues to audit and monitor, and it's being looked at very carefully by all my people at HUD. But it was reopened, and that should be the model for what Kemp and his uh, team would like to do uh, at HUD. Uh, we're going to take the uh, retirement service program aimed at uh, seniors and try to target it more for low-income seniors. It was going to people of a, of a relatively high income, and uh, I felt uh, sincerely that it should be targeted. I feel very strongly about targeting these scarce resources towards low-income communities and, and, uh, and uh, poorer or low-income uh, people, like CDBG, I think, it should be looked at to, to take out the swimming pools and make sure that it does what uh, all of us want done in community development uh, block grant programs. Uh, as, far as, uh, 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 as far as Title X, I think co-insurance uh, co you mentioned. I think co-insurance, as I said earlier, can play a role. We want to look at it carefully. We're going to do it very carefully. And uh, Fitz and I, uh, Ms. Uh, Austin Fitz and I will be back in September uh, with some recommendations to this committee and to the Gonzales Committee and, and to the uh, 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 um, interested uh, uh, committees in the U.S. Senate. As far as Title X, I don't think it helps poor people. I think it was designed for upper income developers, uh, and they are not my constituents. Um, and uh, uh, it would have had unconscionable losses. Uh, I think it was poorly designed, poorly targeted. But goodness gracious, we've got over 50 programs or so at HUD. Uh, there ought to be one or two that we ought to be willing, as you put it, uh, to. Uh, to eliminate and uh, make those monies. I'm not trying to right. get rid of the money. I would like to make sure that the good programs that we want at HUD and that we want to implement at HUD uh, can be done better and more efficiently and, and better targeted. And frankly, I'd like to use the tax code. I've long said that the tax code should be used for socially desirable goals. And Mr. Chairman, and to the members of the committee to the left, I can't think of more socially desirable goals than housing, home ownership. Uh, jobs and economic development in low-income communities, less developed communities, I call them LDCs. I know the gentleman's interest in third world poverty. Well, we've got poverty in our own low LDC, less developed communities and neighborhoods and families, and that's where HUD wants to target its uh, resources. So you have my commitment on that, and, and uh, I look forward to working. And let me say, Mr. Secretary, I mean, if you find that a program doesn't work and needs elimination, I think you... Uh, needs being eliminated. Uh, I think you'll find a receptive ear, provided the constraint you mentioned is there, and that is that the monies will be put in another more worthwhile program. You know, we're sort of shell-shocked a little bit, because for eight years, any time a program was junky, 
uh, or was perceived to be junky and didn't have the political support, it was eliminated, and then the money vanished or ended up in the space station or somewhere else. And, uh, well, we need a space station, and yeah, we okay. need I didn't fence, want to get and your we need housing, and we need station. jobs. And, uh, but the bottom line is, I, all I'm saying is I think the idea that you have to keep every existing yeah. program is Good. not one that I support and many Good. other people would support, although Good. we certainly would feel we have to keep, at a very minimum, a, a su sufficient uh, level of funds uh, to help the people, Good. and you have said that. Final question that I had, and I'll ask you more about this tomorrow when you come before the Gonzales Committee where I'll be able to be there. Um, yeah, you are. <laughs> Welcome. This is just the no, first just, half. But, um, I can hardly uh, wait. Uh, I think you'll get a good reception there. I really do. I um, always the, had a good reception. The, I have been crafting over the course of the ne last several months some, you know, some legislation aimed at uh, changing this, and uh, it involves a variety of different things. And I have a few questions that maybe you could think about and maybe we could answer tomorrow. Uh, one is, do you think there should be a limit placed on consultant fees, whether it be per hour, uh, at all, et cetera? I'll come back and ask you these tomorrow, but I just wanted to give you a little time. Second, should there be some kind of provision, as I am uh, trying to uh, toy with, on insider information, the concept of insider information. It seems that in so many of these scandals, some people gave out information that only a few people were privy to, and that is a valuable commodity just as it would be in stock trading, and we ought to eliminate that and create some real penalties for that. Um, third, better disclosure so that when there is a discretionary program, and HUD's programs until this country gets a lot richer will be discretionary and not entitlements, uh, uh, so that they're required to be announced, there can be far more openness in terms of how uh, the programs are, are announced and uh, the criteria, the requirements, the suggestions, et cetera. And finally, uh, something on tax credits requiring HUD to consider the use of tax credits when awarding a subsidy. In other words, don't say, well, here's the subsidy, you make 11 percent, but then when the tax credits come along, you get $800 million uh, extra or $80 million extra. So th that's the direction. I've talked to Chairman Gonzalez about this kind of legislation and uh, I, I appreciate working that. with I'll, both I'll Chairman. Let me just say to you, Charlie, I'll look forward to spending some time with you on that question tomorrow because right. there are parts of that which we strongly support. I wrote Chairman Rangel about the use, the misuse of tax credits. I am a strong supporter of the low-income tax credit for, uh, uh, for housing, as I testified. And we wrote Chairman Rangel about making sure that they weren't used uh, and abused. So uh, by, uh, but uh, there are some parts of your bill that uh, I would love to visit with you about, and I'll be prepared tomorrow. Right. But anything sure. we can do to get the consultants out altogether, I would be happy to uh, do but I and, and and I want to make the point again that uh, I'm not looking for more uh, discretion at HUD I think there's been too much in the past I want the perception as well as the reality of fairness and I think when the secretary himself or herself were to make a decision it ought not to be predicated upon uh, subjectivity it ought to be uh, predicated upon objective criteria to the extent possible to the extent possible I think that's what the chairman would like and I, that's certainly what I'd like to do uh, at HUD uh, in my four years. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank, thank you very you. much. Ms. Secretary, I want to thank you and your associates for, for an outstanding uh, set of uh, statements. Uh, you had the full confidence of the subcommittee when you came thank in, you. and you have the full confidence of the subcommittee as you leave. <coughs> I feel good thank about uh, Jack Kemp being our Secretary of uh, Housing and Urban Development. And I think so do the American people. And let me just say in conclusion that the National Football League's <laughs> loss is the nation's gain. I appreciate that, Mr. This, Chairman. This uh, hearing is concluded. Thank you very much. For more information about the issues discussed in this hearing, please write to the House Government Operations Subcommittee on Employment and Housing. The address is room B349A of the Rayburn House Office Building, Washington, D.C., 
20515. Stay with us now for coverage of a meeting of the House and Senate conferees who met to begin working out differences on bills to reform the savings and loan industry. <laughs> 